uh, briefly uh, a recap of the awardees. Uh, the Professional Career Award um, for Dr. Vance uh, Trudeau, professor at the University of Ottawa. The Professional Early Career Award, uh, myself, Jan Menigen, associate professor at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Postdoctoral Fellow Award, Roxanne Berube at Wayne State University in the US. And PhD Student Award to Vicky Chatong Wang, uh, PhD student at McGill University. Congratulations to everyone. And uh, we will get started. So this is not the order. Um, if, if you remember from the uh, timeline in which we proceed. But uh, it's my great pleasure then to introduce um, our first speaker, uh, Vance Trudeau. Vance Trudeau is a professor, as I mentioned, at the University of Ottawa. Uh, among his diverse interests um, uh, are, of course, the study of endocrine disrupting uh, effects of sex steroids and diverse pollutants. Uh, these include pharmaceuticals, pesticides, uh, more recently also petroleum products. Uh, and he studies their effects on development and reproduction in fishes and uh, frogs. And today, Vance is uh, going to talk about a seminal work on transgenerational disruption of the stress response in fish, so specific endocrine axis, raising the red flag for antidepressants in the aquatic environment. Um, so I'll stop sharing here, Vance, and so you should be able to share your um, screen and presentation with us. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, is the slides projecting properly? Looks great. Okay. Uh, let's see, where is the pointer? Uh, I'm just trying to find the pointer here. Um, I might need to just get out of this for one second. Sorry, guys. One moment. Um, I think if you're in presentation mode, Vance, at the bottom of the slide, there might be some symbols, um, if, if that's what you see on yours. And um, one of those, if you click on it, gives you access to them. Yeah, that's the what laser. I'm looking for right now. Um, anyway. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing it. So I'll just. I'll just do it without. I think you can see my my. We can see your mouse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's go for that. So, uh, so I'm I'm completely honored by this uh, this award. I I do thank my nominators and of course the the wonderful network that uh, many people have contributed to to set up. It's it's like a dream to have a a network uh, of people all over the world. Uh, but initiated in uh, Quebec and Canada uh, um, to have this intense study on endocrine disruptors. It is it is the pollution uh, concern of our generations. So um, I'm live from uh, Anishinaabewaki, in the University of Ottawa, and my work on fish and, and on frogs is, is on unceded territory, and I, I'd like to recognize that from the beginning. So uh, this is a very lengthy story starting uh, way back, actually, with, uh, with Jan Menigen when he was a, a student in the lab, but I'm not going back that far. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about our, our transgenerational uh, work on something called Prozac, an antidepressant. So that's the, the topic today. Uh, I'm just going to see how this thing works here. Uh, the slides are not, of course, there's always something, isn't there? Ah, here we go. So we got interested in fluoxetine quite a long time ago. It's the active ingredient in uh, the antidepressant Prozac. Uh, it was introduced in the late 80s. Uh, still remains highly prescribed. It's no longer number one. It's number four or five on the the list of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This uh, very um, important class of uh, of drugs. And and the interesting thing about this chemical is that the first pass metabolite, norfluoxetine, is equipotent in most assays with the parent compound. And both of them are part of the therapy. Uh, but also part of the side effects and part of the problem in the environment because both of them, parent and metabolite, are released to the environment. So that's the the the, the stage I, I'd like to set. I'm just going to... Oh, 
Okay, so now it's working. So SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. These, these chemicals bind to a particular membrane protein to uh, stop the uptake of serotonin, and uh, that gives benefit to a certain number of patients. So why do we care about serotonin or 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine? Well, 5-HT is a, a neurotransmitter and it is a hormone. In various circuits and ways, it can control growth hormone release, it can control reproduction, in particular, those that you like uh, pasta and good cakes, uh, serotonin is very important for your carbohydrate appetite uh, and the stress axis, which I'll tell you a lot about today. But therapeutically, of course, we take it uh, or prescribe it because of uh, regulation of social interactions and mood in, in, in depressed patients um, in particular. Now, for the story today, it's important to note that uh, serotonin and the development of those early circuits are really important for programming the stress axis. Therefore, any disruption has a chance to uh, wreak havoc on the endocrine system. So what is the problem? Fluoxetine and like chemicals are highly prescribed. And the particular concern is, uh, is twofold. One is for the depressed um, preparta mother uh, uh, who uh, under very strict conditions can be uh, prescribed antidepressants. And fluoxetine, as an example, can be found in amno amniotic fluid down here at the bottom of the slide, and various measures of core blood put it in the 20 to 80 micrograms per liter range for the developing human uh, fetus. Uh, when it's uh, secreted or excreted by, by patients taking it, uh, uh, there is a chance for it to, to uh, reach water uh, bodies through effluent release and affect uh, aquatic organisms. Our interest is in, in fish, and this study will be about the, the model organism uh, zebrafish. And uh, the highest level of fluoxetine is very high. Uh, and uh, if you take fluoxetine and the other SSRIs, you're well over a microgram per liter in, in um, heavily polluted areas. So this is a, a particular concern. So um, when we were designing these experiments quite a long time ago with uh, Marilyn Vera Chang and her co-supervisor, Tom Moon, we stumbled across this paper by uh, Tim Oberlander, uh, a pediatric psychiatrist at the University of British Columbia. And he's been studying um, uh, mothers and their babies uh, from this, this cohort of, of, of difficult situations where, where there are mothers that are depressed and are prescribed uh, SSRIs. So this is the salivary cortisol level at three months of age in some of those babies who he's been following since the early 2000s. So this is from 2008, the data, but of course uh, the, the, uh, the sampling was before that. Here's non-SSRI exposed cortisol levels. And here are, are uh, the salivary cortisol levels in uh, babies whose mom have been exposed by taking SSRIs. You're looking at uh, more than uh, half of the cortisol. So this really grabbed our attention, as you can imagine. So the big question here is, what are the long-term consequences of Prozac exposure, be it in the human fetus, or across generations and fish. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. We're going to look at the disruption of the stress axis and transgenerational disruption of the stress response. So uh, fish are great models for, for the stress response because the hypothalamo-pituitary adrenal axis is, is well conserved when you compare many animals. And I'm just going to take you through some of the particularities of the fish. Here you have a beautiful uh, fish brain with little uh, colored parts. Uh, the most important thing to know is that when there's a stressor, the raphe nucleus over here is activated, serotonin is released, and this can impinge on the green and the blue, which are the, the neuroendocrine territories of the brain, the hypothalamus and the preoptic area. They are involved, whoops, this is very sensitive here. I don't know why it's doing this. 
Um, it won't let me go back now. Uh, okay. They are uh, the neuroendocrine territories communicating with the pituitary. And there's a neuropeptide CRF that stimulates the pituitary to release ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, a neuropeptide released into the blood affecting the steroid producing cells of the adrenal. And the particularity of fish is that there is an interrenal gland, which is a mixture of those steroidogenic tissues and other tissues that I'll tell you about later. The most important part is that ACTH stimulates cortisol. So these terms will come up uh, quite often in the next couple of minutes. I'm going to have to do something here. Okay, so this is a complicated experiment, uh, but not that complicated. The important thing to know at the beginning is the development of the serotonergic and the adrenal axis is at the same time in the first week of life. So you have uh, fertilization and hatching, and we started our fluoxetine exposure just after uh, hatching. And over the next couple of days, the serotonergic circuits are developing, programming the HPI axis. The HPI axis uh, becomes functional around four days and is fully responsive, uh, developing over the next couple of days. So our experiments cover that period. So embryos are collected, exposed for six days, be it control, the environmental or LFL, low fluoxetine, and the therapeutic dose that a fetus would be exposed to in those uh, mothers in difficult situations. And then uh, they are put into fresh water for generations. We raise them to six months, then we do different tests. Physiological stress, so a net, net handling stressor and look at whole body cortisol as a measure of stress. Uh, what is the importance of locomotion and exploration as a, as a coping behavior? in the novel tank test, and the breeding and reproductive sex success. And I'm not gonna talk about that today because effects don't show up until the fourth generation. So that would be another talk. So that's the, 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 um, the experimental design uh, from Marilyn Vera Chang's work. So uh, on the next couple of slides, you will see cortisol and basal and stress response. And in these different colors, you will see the control the low fluoxetine and the high fluoxetine that I just described. So we jumped for joy in this data, and you can see the uh, uh, basal and stress in a white bar. You have a stress response as expected. And in this particular instance, both low and high fluoxetine reduce the basal cortisol level and significantly reduced the response to the, the stress, um, the netting stress. So this was very interesting. So this became our measure over the next generations. Remember, they were only exposed as embryos for six days and their descendants and along the way for generations never saw Prozac uh, again. Boom, F1, stress response in a white bar that is reduced by both doses of fluoxetine. Raise their descendants in fresh water, go to F2, Basal levels are here. We have the clear stress response. Again, at both doses of uh, fluoxetine, the environmental and the therapeutic, you have a much reduced stress response. Do the same thing again for F3. So another six months of uh, these adults, a stress response. We're starting to lose the effect of the low fluoxetine but the high fluoxetine still is uh, decreasing the stress response. So cortisol, of course, is uh, the so-called stress hormone. It's the adaptive hormone. And uh, this is the one that allows us to deal with daily life, so-called stressors. And an appropriate stress response is very important. Uh, an accent uh, accentuated stress response or a reduced stress response can wreak havoc on your homeostatic uh, control mechanism. So uh, this is quite significant that it persists for so long. So where does that effect reside? Is it in the brain? Is it in the pituitary? Is it in the adrenal gland? So I'm just going to jump 
to the punchline here that the adrenal uh, cells that produce cortisol in the interrenal cells of the the uh, the the fish adrenal uh, they have a, an impaired uh, response and here's the experiments that show that so uh, we simulated the pituitary communication by injecting ACTH and that would invoke an increase a rapid uh, increase in cortisol so ACTH injections, and I'll describe you uh, in a moment the particularities of that experiment. Um, I forgot to mention that the, the males are more susceptible than the females. So the data I showed you is from males. Females have a similar but attenuated effect of, of fluoxetine. So the data are from males. Again, cortisol levels and the various treatments. Uh, so in the F0, you have uh, no injection, so just taking the animals and you have a decrease in the basal uh, cortisol levels. The saline handling, so a light anesthetic injection of saline is a stress response. It's a mild handling stress and uh, cortisol goes up in the white bars. And that mild stress is uh, reduced, that mild stress response is reduced in the low fluoxetine and the high fluoxetine treatments as is the uh, effect of ACT. It is reduced in the high fluoxetine um, treatment group. So let's raise those animals. F3, do the same thing. You would get essentially the same response. There is a stress response to the mild saline injection handling that is reduced in both groups. And the ACTH response itself is reduced in uh, those uh, fluoxetine exposed animals. Remember, they were exposed only for six days when the, gra uh, the gra uh, great grandparents were exposed. So this is a transgenerational disruption of the uh, uh, adrenal cells ability to produce cortisol. So here is uh, the, the weird looking organ in a fish here is the interrenal. It is a mixture of renal cells, so uh, kidney cells, adrenal tissues, uh, mostly the steroidogenic cells, but also some of the uh, adrenal medullary cells that were producing catecholamines. So it's a thin layer of cells. As you can see, whoops, there we go again. Ugh, I don't know what's happening here, guys, sorry. Um, uh, and you can peel it off. You take the membrane off and you can peel this structure right off and put it into RNA sequencing experiments. So it is a mixed tissue. I'm just going to focus completely on the, uh, the steroidogenic aspects of that. We did a huge RNA sequencing experiment, both in uh, F0 and F3, concluding that the steroidogenic pathways uh, and many other things are disrupted for three generations. So here is a summary of a, a huge and important data set, and I'm just going to jump to it. Here's ACTH acting on its GPCR that then invokes uh, the, the cyclic AMP protein kinase A pathway. For steroids, you need mobilization of cholesterol. So the things in red circles are the, the pathways that we identified in our data sets that are uh, affected. So you need cholesterol uh, for uh, synthesis down here in the uh, mitochondrion. Uh, uh, cholesterol is converted first to pregnenolone. That enzyme is affected. And then it's exported. And then in the ER, you have conversion of pregnenolone to the various pre uh, precursors and intermediates. The CYP17 and CYP21 is affected. Then you have reuptake of the 11-deoxycortisol uh, into the mitochondria, whereas the key enzyme, 11-beta-hydroxylase, is also affected, and then decreasing cortisol production. So fluoxetine modulates pathways associated with steroidogenesis. It also disrupts steroidogenesis itself. So what does that mean? What uh, does it have any significance to the coping behaviors of, of, uh, of the animal? So we use the novel tank uh, text from uh, Rick Egan in Zurich, 
and uh, this is a, a test that many people are using, throw a fish into a new tank, film it for six minutes and track its speed and its position and those types of things. So we did that over generations and uh, uh, I will show you that it's linked to cortisol, the, the changes. So here is Marilyn Vera Chang's work, uh, came out some years ago, and she looked at all those different aspects of behavior, distance, speed, position, and she did a massive uh, principal component analysis, isolating PC1. And uh, what you can see here is the results. I'll show you the video in a moment, but here is PC1 over generations. So you can see the high dose of fluoxetine decreases this exploratory locomotive behavior for the generation exposed, their descendants in F1, their descendants in F2, and by F3, this wanes. You can no longer see the disturbed behavior, this coping behavior, the ability to explore uh, uh, the novel tank. So it lasts for uh, quite a few generations, but not till F3. It's a very, very profound effect. So the, the important part then is the low cortisol responsible for this reduced exploratory behavior. So we could not find that link in the literature, so we had to delve into that. And we used another chemical called metiropone that would knock out cholesterol, uh, sorry, uh, cortisol uh, synthesis to mimic the supposed effects of fluoxetine. And then we can uh, do a cortisol supplementation to ask the question whether um, we can rescue this impaired behavior. So that's the next set of experiments. Um, so cholesterol is uh, converted by the side chain cleavage enzyme into the universal steroid precursor, uh, pregnenolone. And through these various enzyme steps that I alluded to, will be converted to cortisol. And we're lucky to have a, a, a chemical called metiropone that blocks this last step. So it, it, it blocks this last step of conversion of 11 deoxy to cortisol. So we can use it as a tool to try to recapitulate the effects of fluoxetine. So here is Marilyn's experiment. And uh, here is the, uh, the animals. Uh, uh, with a seven-day metiropone uh, treatment, and at the end, we do the novel tank test. We sacrifice them after that, and we look at the cortisol levels. These are animals that never went through any other manipulations. And you can see a very nice stress response in the controls, and those that uh, have received metiropone uh, do not have the ability to respond to that, uh, that stress, that, that, uh, that stress. So, uh, so that is the the, uh, the effect, and when you look at the coping behavior, the same principal component, metiropone reduces the exploratory behavior to the same extent that the fluoxetine uh, did. So we think that the exploratory behavior is related to this cortisol disruption, and here here's the the what we think is the proof: cortisol levels. Uh, in F0, uh, and uh, and here is the, the effects. So here's the control. Here's the high fluoxetine, and high fluoxetine supplemented with cortisol in the water. So we, we, we shoot above normal, uh, it's kind of high physiological levels. Uh, and then we looked at the PC1 again. So the high fluoxetine reduces exploratory behavior, so we're on this panel here. And the supplementation of uh, cortisol restores that behavior. So that's not too exciting in terms of just watching these boxes. So I'm going to show you uh, just a, a video of what these animals are acting like in their tanks. And uh, I'll just convert it here. Uh, here is a control fish in the novel tank test. You can see the animal swimming up and down, uh, very uh, robustly swimming. Uh, you can notice already quite a difference in the high fluoxetine animal. At the beginning, they swam around and they just kind of sit at the bottom. And they'll occasionally go up and down over the six minutes. 
So this is not an extreme animal. This is a, an animal we picked that represents the median of the response. And you'll notice already in the high uh, fluoxetine uh, treatment, they have a different behavior that resembles the control. They, in fact, spend more time at the top of the tank exploring that. And in some animals, they get a little hyper and they actually start wanting to jump out of the water. So I hope uh, you're convinced that high fluoxetine is changing uh, their cortisol and changing their behavior. So what are the implications of this type of data? So uh, uh, cortisol disruption, so the stress axis disruption by antidepressants is of high concern, at least in my opinion, for both humans and aquatic animals. So it's showing you the fish data, but uh, we had the, the uh, Marilyn and I went to a, a wonderful lecture by Bruce McEwen at the, some of the lectures, the, the annual lectures at Carleton University. And he, he uh, is the allostasis hypothesis guy. Unfortunately, he passed away just a couple of years ago, but we told him about the data. And he says, you guys have to get into the hypercortisolism literature. Everybody studies. I remember his, his, he's very excited. Everybody studies high stress and cortisol uh, elevated for a long time, but chronic hypocortisolism is equally bad for the health. It's associated with burnouts, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, immune disorders, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder patients. So we dug into that and the hypocortisolism that we are producing by, uh, by fluoxetine treatments uh, is associated with changes in a coping behavior in the fish model. So then, of course, if you're talking stress, you must go to the McGill professor, Hans Selye, the originator of the concept of stress as an adaptive response. And I love this quote. Uh, Every stress leaves an indelible scar, and the organism pays for it, survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little older. And of course, that means you, you, you might survive, but you have some effects. Your health will decrease. And, and this is the idea of, of, of uh, altered stress responses. Uh, I'd like to do a little more speculation here. Digging again into Tim Oberlander's data. So he's following these patients and there's different data that come out at different time. And these are the children of those uh, depressed moms that were given SSRIs in the early 2000s. So here's the, the, the human behavior, the age of assessment and the effect. So uh, internalization. So that is, uh, if you have a young child, you put them in a room of strangers or other kids and they're really not interactive. They kind of sit in the corner. That is increased. And in, uh, in, in the children of those depressed moms, the anxious behavior is increased in those children. Gross motor function in young uh, infants is decreased, uh, somewhat resembling what I just told you about the fish. I'm not saying that it's happening in, in humans, but it really raises our concern uh, for our own species and especially the children. So here's a little bit of fun uh, for the last couple of slides. Uh, Marilyn and I put this together to try to look at our generations of work and put it into human generations for a little bit of fun. So uh, already in uh, 2013, these are very long studies to, to, to initiate and to complete. We had the first data showing reduction in cortisol and decrease in exploratory behavior in our F0 animals. If you put this in Prozac terms, it came on the market and the first patients were taking it in 1986. Let's say there were parents that were 20 or 25 years old, the average generation time for our species. 20 years later was 2006. Our F1 were appearing in 2014, where we had the same thing. Late 2014, our F2, which would be 
2026, which is, uh, we're on the verge of 2026. These are the grandchildren. We still have reduced cortisol, decreased exploratory behavior, and we were starting to get ready for our next experiments on uh, uh, interrenal function, which happened in 2015. So the F3, 2046, the future, the great ch grandchildren. We found still a persistence of reduced cortisol. And the transcriptomic and the ACTH experiments were showing us that it was an impaired uh, interrenal function. The data I did not show you is the future. What if uh, F4 was exposed to a different chemical, uh, to another antidepressant is what we did, and I'll summarize three or four studies in a couple of seconds. Uh, if you expose them to another antidepressant, the stress response is again reduced, and we see a particularity in the reproductive behavior. Uh, you have uh, only one third of animals able to breed in the second exposure. So things uh, are to come when we start studying these transgenerational effects. And that was in F4. Okay. So what's the take home message? And then the last two slides. Chemical exposures and stressors may not have repercussions or effects in our lives but also our descendants. That's the quote, that's my quote. And I just wanna give you two more slides. Uh, uh, what is the next step? So Amin Nozari graduated, uh, but he found the stress sensitive transgenic line that where there's a, a positive correlation between EGFP in the larvae and the brain with cortisol. And uh, my student, co-supervised by Carol Yock, Emmanuel Moniez, is taking this to the next level uh, because, okay, we need a test to predict effects of these chemicals in one generation and the subsequent generation. So we're working with scientists at Health Canada to develop a screening method for these types of chemicals. Thank you for the award. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vance. Um, please join me in congratulating Vance uh, once again um, on the award. And the floor is open uh, for questions for Vance. So maybe while we wait, uh, Vance, I'll start with uh, one question. So if you have questions, please uh, raise your hands in the, in the chat so I can see um, that you do want to ask a question. It's five minutes per talk for questions. And uh, if you do have one, please raise your hand there. Um, one question I advance is, um, so you mentioned the epidemiological data. Um, and while you said, you know, we have to be careful to sort of make that comparison. I was wondering if in those infants, um, so that's the F1 generation of exposed mothers, um, if there were sex differences as well, to your knowledge, um, because, you know, you had quite a sort of distinct effect on the uh, on the males, of course, which are more responsive in the zebrafish model to to stress, uh, diverse stressors. Um, so I was wondering if, if there's sort of a similar pattern or if anything is known in that uh, human cohort in the epidemiological uh, yeah. side. Great, great question. Um, I would have to look carefully at the data. Uh, I don't know about uh, sex differences in the, in the in the babies. Um, but we have we have other we have other sex differences I didn't have a, a chance to to mention. Uh, so a time of uh, the time window of exposure. So we've done some early and some day fifteen exposures, and and then you you can actually get a, a more pronounced effect in females if you delay the uh, the exposure. So there's certainly some things to to explore there. Uh, we know there's uh, sex differences uh, in in stress responses in our own species. Um, uh, women, at least, I don't know about young uh, young female children, but women uh, deal with uh, certain stresses better than men. Men deal with other stressors better than women. So there's certainly something to to explore there, no doubt. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Vance? Don't be shy. <laughs> I 
Yep, yeah, there's a question. Uh, Carol York. Carol, please go ahead. Congratulations, Vance. That was a, a wonderful presentation. I really uh, enjoyed it. Learn something new every time. I'm curious your thoughts about, so mothers who are depressed need to take something. Um, if they didn't take something, what do you speculate would be the impacts multi-generationally on having a depressed mother, for example? So, well, yeah, you know, about the flip side of all of this. Well, I, I was I've been able to talk to a couple of um, uh, pediatric psychiatrists, uh, Tim Oberlander, and um, through chats on online, but also when I was in Argentina giving this talk, uh, somebody that has depressed moms in her clinic uh, said, "Well, you know, it's under very careful conditions." And it's when there is a danger, so very severe cases, when there's a day and a danger to mom or baby. So we're talking about very severe cases where they'll prescribe these heavy drugs. So that's that's in a situation where the mother might harm herself or or the okay. baby. So these are quite severe uh, situations. So uh, in those very difficult situations, the risk is 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 quite severe suicide or what have you. In more mild patients, of course, it's under uh, supervision and, and perhaps more of the psychological coaching um, and, and and those types of things and, and monitoring rather than taking these uh, very heavy uh, pharmaceuticals. So there, it seems that the, the, the woman that came up to me in, in Buenos Aires, she, she has dealt with these cases herself and she, she has uh, witnessed some of the things that we're talking about today. Right. So it, it seems to be observed by, by clinicians. Right, thank you. Great, we have time for two more questions. Um, so Isabel first, Isabel Plant, and uh, Chris Tufts after that. Oh, and Diana, okay, really three nice questions, time. Diana after that, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll go quickly. <laughs> yeah, really nice talk as usual. I'm just wondering, like, I know like, fish don't breastfeed of course but you know a lot of women get well, not a lot of but uh many women uh, has postpartum depression so you know lo lots of those chemicals are taken when the kids are early age and can pass through breast milk as i said like you cannot mimic that with fish because they are not breastfeeding obviously but have you ever tried to expose like larvia to uh to those chemicals and see what is happening Yes, two two things. We've done some where you do the the we're we're exposing the larvae already, so that's the advantage of fish. So that that's mimicking the the maternal exposure, but um, so that that definitely works. But uh, but uh, our friend and colleague um, Matt Vijayan in at Calgary has done something very interesting, and he's injected the antidepressants into the egg uh, directly. It's it's very painstaking work. Uh, but it's 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 a direct dose idea. We just put it in them in the water. But yeah, so so the postpartum idea it does show up in milk, as like many chemicals do. So so uh, some of the circuits have, have already formed, but they're not mature. And of course, it has a high potential to affect uh, the 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 child. In our exposures, early six days and late fifteen days we do see differences. So there is obviously some developmental exposure windows uh, as well. Okay, next question. Uh, thanks for your talk, Vance, and congratulations on the award. Um, I think you Great mentioned early on that um, that Prozac is no longer the most widely prescribed antidepressant. Have yeah. you looked at, at what is, like, are, are the effects of, of more widely prescribed drugs similar? Um. So for the last part, we, we uh, th they're not necessarily similar, and we're starting to look at this in more detail. The the uh, the, the generation four experiment I, I uh, alluded to was with venlafaxine. Mm. So uh, venlafaxine in the literature and in our hands, there are some differences. Uh, it variably does modulate the stress axis, but the the more profound effect we found was was inhibition of reproduction. Uh, the uh, so uh, what Emmanuel is doing is trying to get a screening method to be able to answer some of those questions uh, 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 
what are the other antidepressants doing? So we're, we're looking at a couple of them just now. So uh, you'll have to wait just a little bit for that answer, Chris. <laughs> Very Thanks, Val, for, for the yeah. talk. Yes. Um, how about the relation of this hypocortisol condition with the uh, hypo, yeah, hypocortisol condition with um, another endocrine pathway, for example, the thyroid hormone pathway, or, you know, between the. Right. Do you know something about that? Like, uh, no, how we, is in humans? We don't know anything about that. Um... One, one would predict that uh, there would be effects on many, many tissues because of cortisol importance in, in controlling metabolism and uh, liver function, these kind of things. Uh, we were able to look at the uh, interrenal with, uh, with, Vera, uh, with um, Dr. Vera Chang, uh, but with Amin Nozari, we looked at the, at the brain and we can uh, witness major transcriptomic changes in the in the developing brain with exposure oh. so one would predict all kinds of things uh, neurogenesis is altered uh, those types of things in, in the brain tissues are also affected so one would one would predict other other behavioral effects and other endocrine effects great thanks thank you very much so uh, in the interest of time we did start a little bit late but uh, moving on and um so thank you again, Vance. And it's my great thank pleasure you. to introduce our next speaker, um, Roxanne Birubé. Roxanne is a postdoctoral fellow at Wayne State University uh, in Christopher uh, Casotis' lab. She's interested in understanding the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals on the disruption of the AHR pathway, leading specifically to liver and metabolic health issues. And today she'll present for us um, on the effects of PFAS and chemical mixtures uh, on metabolic health, neurodevelopment, and gene expression in uh, zebrafish. And Thank please you. join me in congratulating Roxanne one more time as well um, on the award. Sorry, Roxanne. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Everything's fine? Looks great. Perfect. So as um, Dr. Menigan mentioned, I'm a postdoc with Chris Casotis here at Wayne State University. And today I'm presenting to you really one of the multiple projects that I'm working on um, in his lab. Um, there you go. Uh, so as you may know, uh, obesity is um, prevalent here in the United States where almost half of the population is considered obese. Um, and obesity is also increasing worldwide. So Canada is not immune to it either. Um, and it's also not only increasing in um, high income country anymore as we thought it was previously. And while being obese or overweight does not always um, relate to um, metabolic health issue or being um, unhealthy, it does. Um, it can be related to metabolic dysfunction, diabetes, and cardiovascular issues. And multiple recent studies have shown that the usual factors such as genetics, activity, and calorie intake are not sufficient anymore to explain this increasing trend in obesity worldwide. So what could be creating the strength? Um, well, there was a surge in chemical production around the 50s and the 60s. And um, around the 2000, um, new studies demonstrated that this increase in chemical production was also um, related, seemed to be related to also the increasing of prevalence of obesity in the world. And of course, as we are all interested in endocrine dis disrupting chemicals, well, this is what I will be focusing on today to understand um, this increasing trend in obesity um, because endocrine disrupting chemical has been uh, proven to influence weight gain, lipid accumulation, and also disrupt metabolic homeostasis. And in the Casoris lab, our hypothesis is that we are chronically exposed to these chemicals um, by multiple uh, routes. Um, how are we exposed to these chemicals? We're in our home. Uh, don't look too far. There's multiple sources in our home of EDCs. Um, and one source that we were interested in is our household dust. Um, as reported previously by um, Dr. Kazotis and his team, multiple um, chemicals are found in household dust and many co-occurring chemicals are mixtures of organic and inorganics. 
Um, and earlier this year, in 2023, we published the first study uh, using in vitro, so using cell culture, to verify the capacity of these chemicals to disrupt endocrine uh, function and act as EDCs. And we focus on various chemicals individually and in mixture. So here's a table of our chemicals. Um, in that previous study, we used PCBs, but today I will not be uh, discussing them. I will be focusing on these seven chemicals. First of all, we uh, used PFOA and PFOS, and we also used them in an equimolar mixture. We also used two brominated flame retardant individually and in mixture. And we also used three inorganics, um, lead, sodium, and no, lead, arsenic, and cadmium. And we also um, mix them together in an equimolar mixture. And finally, we also, because we were interested in the whole mixture from a household dust, we prepared an environmental mixture. And um, that mixture to represent household dust contain a hundred times more inorganics than organic chemical. So here are um, some results from this in vitro study. Uh, we did observe that our mixture, here is the mixture results, uh, the mixture of organic, inorganic, and um, all our chemicals combined increased triglyceride accumulation and proliferation in adipocytes. And also here on the right side, we're observing the capacity of these chemicals and mixture to uh, modify act as agonistic or antagonist activity on the PPAR gamma receptor. So based on these results, we um, then aim to push these observations further in vivo using the developmentally exposed zebrafish. And our hypothesis was to observe that um, organic and inorganic mixture will disrupt metabolic signaling such as observed in vivo, in vitro. Um, we also wanted to observe neural development and um, adipose accumulation in our zebrafish. Here is our methodology. We first started to expose our fish at one day post-fertilization and uh, up to day six post-fertilization. At day six, we took a subset of these samples and we did two different assays. The first one was the LMR assay. The LMR assay uses a fluorescent compound which reacts with mit mit uh, mitochondrial byproducts when it's reduced and it becomes fluorescent. So it's um, this assay is used as a proxy for metabolic activity. And then we also wanted to look at the behavior. I wish I had a beautiful uh, video like um, previously was shown, but I don't. But we did look a little bit similar to the fish, how they were swimming um, and tracking them on video. We had a 50 minute essay with an acclimation period, but also alternating periods of light and dark um, treatments. After day six, most of our fish were replaced in a clean water and reared up to day 30. At day 30, we um, collected those fish to take images with NALRED. NALRED is a fluorescent that binds to lipid, which like you see here, can allow us to see the adipose tissues. With those images, we then calculated the length of the fish. Um, and we also quantified 34 different adipose tissue for either absence or presence in each of our fish. Um, lastly, at both of these time point, we collected um, samples to measure gene expression. And now I will start by presenting the results of the day six. Um, yes, the day six. So here are uh, the results presented by type of chemicals. Our first chemical that I'm presenting is the brominated flame retardants. Um, on the left-hand side here, you're seeing the metabolic activity. And on the left, the right, sorry, you see the behavior activity of our fish. The first result that I want to bring your attention to is the red, are in the red boxes. One of our um, BFR, PBB 153, increased metabolic activity and also increased swimming activity of our fish. Then when we look at our other chemical, BDE 47, there is no difference in metabolic activity. However, there is a slight increase in swimming um, distance and activity in these fish for one concentration. So the result of the metabolic activity and the swimming activity are not always related. Keep that in mind for later. And finally, an interesting thing that we saw with the BFR, especially with our, um, our swimming activity, 
is that both of our individual chemical increased our swimming activity at at least one or two concentration. However, when we tested our mixture, there was no differences in the swimming activity from our controls. So here, our mixture effect does not reflect the individual effect of our chemical. And now we're moving on to the PFAS. Uh, same result, the Alamar metabolic activity on the left and behavior on the right. Um, there is very little um, modification in the metabolic activity. We do see a slight decrease um, by the lowest PFOA concentration and a decrease in our highest PFAS mixture here. Um, however, what we are seeing, oops, that move, I'm sorry. Uh, what we're seeing once again is that in our um, swimming activity, the mixture effect does not reflect the individual chemicals. However, oppositely to the BFR, our PFAS here, mixture seem to be more active and more potent than the individual chemicals, which was the opposite for the BFR. And now we're moving on to our inorganic chemicals. Um, Similar to the PFAS, we are seeing here that our um, mixture seems to be more potent and more active than our individual chemical. However, um, here we're seeing a very interesting result with our cadmium exposure, where cadmium was the only chemical who increased swimming activity in the light. And we are seeing that effect reflected in the mixture where the swimming activity is increased in both treatment, either light or dark. Uh, finally, when we looked at the environmental mixture, so remember it's a mixture of all our chemicals, um, once again, fairly uh, few modification of the metabolic activity except at the high concentration of our mixture. And when we look at our uh, behavior activity, we are seeing that same increase in activity in the dark only. So what we're seeing here is that the effect of the total mixture is once again, um, not reflected with the results of our individual chemicals. And even more, we are losing completely the effect of the inorganics where we had the, an increase in swimming distance and activity in the light. And here we are losing completely that effect. Uh, and if you remember, the inorganics are, however, 100 times more concentrated in that mixture than the inorganic. And we're losing completely their effect in that mixture. Um, as I mentioned, we measured uh, gene expression. Uh, these are the results for gene expression at day six only. I am still working on the day 30. Um, here is PPAR gamma. Unfortunately, we do not see um, any significant differences. We do see some observable trends in increase of PPAR gamma with some of our chemicals um, and our TBT, which are controlled. However, our mixture, total mixture, once again, um, no significant differences and increase in paper gum with that mixture. Uh, then we move on to GLUT6. GLUT6 is a glucose transporter. Uh, we do see some increase in activity, uh, not activity, in gene expression of GLUT6. Um, what is interesting here is once again, we see that the individual BFR did cause an increase in GLUT6 from some uh, concentration, but not all. However, if you look at, I know it's a little small, but if you look at the mixture, um, that increase in GLUT1 is completely lost again. So the BFR mixture acts really differently than the individual chemicals. Um, and similar to previously for the PFAS and the inorganics, our mixture seem to be a little more potent than our individual uh, chemicals. And again, our total mixture, complete loss of effect. Um, the effects are completely mitigated in our um, total mixture compared to each individual component and even compared to our mixture by type of chemical. And now we're moving on to the, the 30 results. Um, the first result we're seeing here is a heat map of the quantification of the depot. So as I mentioned, we quantify depots um, from a previously published paper by Rawls and his team. In purple, we saw the um, internal adipose depots, and in green is the subcutaneous adipose depot. Um, in the red box, you see our DMSO fish, which are controlled fish. 
Um, there is some depots here that were found in most of our fish that are uh, internal depots and barely any depots in the subcutaneous category. However, if you look at all our chemicals together, we do see a high variability of these internal depots, uh, not internal, I'm sorry, subcutaneous depots. So our fish seem exposed to our treatment seem to have an increased um, type of depots and variability of these depots. And so thus having more variability and more adipose tissues means that we have bigger fish. Well, yes. <laughs> what we're seeing here is the BMI of those fish. So I measure length and weight to calculate the BMI. And what we're seeing is really an increase in BMI by the majority of our treatment, um, with the exception of our BFRs. If you remember earlier, our individual chemical did increase activity and swimming behavior, and the mixture of BFR did not. Well, here we're seeing the opposite trend where our individual BFR did not have an effect on the increase of BMI, but the mixture do have an effect on the BMI of those fish. So those fish are bigger, but not the fish exposed to the individual chemicals. So what does that mean? Um, the fish at day six were swimming more in the individual chemical treatments by the BFR, and they were not swimming more when they were exposed to the mixture. Is that why they're bigger? Well, maybe. However, in our in vitro study, we did demonstrate similar effects where our individual BFR did not really modify uh, triglyceride accumulation in the differentiated adipocyte, but the mixture did. So we can here suggest that the mixture really has an effect on um, the accumulation of adipose depots in our fish. Um, rapidly, if we go through all the other treatment, we can see kind of similar results than day six, where um, the PFAS individually do increase uh, BMI, but only at high concentration, whereas the mixture is more potent, where most of our concentration increased BMI, similar with the inorganics, where the individual mixture have an effect of increasing BMI and our inorganic mixture has a bigger effect at all concentration increase the BMI. And once again, our environmental mixture surprisingly increased BMI only at the two lowest concentration, but not at high concentration. So we're kind of losing again that uh, individual and it, that individual chemical effect in our total mixture. So um what we're looking at here is I'm trying to understand that relation of adipose accumulation in regards to length. Um, in the literature, it is a common relation um, that adipose tissue accumulate in function of the length of those fish. However, what I, I am trying to see here is, are our treatments affecting that normal relation? Well, it seems that it is. If we are looking at this graph in black, you have our DMSO control. And in the green, are here are BFR mixtures. Um, if you look at that particular um, relation here in dark green is our highest concentration of BFR, we are seeing a, a slope that is much steeper, which can relate to a faster and higher accumulation of adipose for the same length of those fish. So our chemical and exposure seem to change and modify that normal relation of growth accumulation of adipose to length of our fish. And if we look a little deeper, we see that um, there's a lot of variability in those relation. And um, there is similar work by my colleague, Samantha Hellman, which is a PhD candidate in our lab. And she demonstrated that for chemicals, um, some of her chemicals seem to have an exponential relationship more than a linear relationship, which I'm presenting here. So I think there's a little bit of work that I need to do here to really understand how our treatment is, are, are modifying that relation of um, adipose accumulation to length and growth of our fish. Uh, and one more thing about that result that I wanna present to you. Here, we're looking at the inorganics and the total mixture. Um, once again, the area of adipose tissue and the length of our fish. And if you're looking here at the bottom of the graphs in the red circle, we're seeing a lot of fish that um, regardless of their length, they do not have any adipose tissue at all. 
So what are those fish? Why are they so different? Well, not all of them, but, but for some of those fish, what I've seen here is this type of fish. What you think here might be some adipose uh, tissue is not. It's actually a fatty liver. So what we're seeing is fish that instead of having adipose tissue, they accumulate fat in their liver. Um, and fatty liver disease are important and are increasing in the population. They affect now more than 25% of our population. Um, there is the classic, the classic, there is one non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is really related to obesity, metabolic syndrome. But um, there is also a new phenotype of fatty liver, which is more associated to pharmaceutical and pollutants. It's the same phenotype, but it's um, with different causes. Um, and also, uh, yeah, I'll come back to those later, but these fish are really interesting um, to study. So globally with this project, um, at day six, we did observe low changes in metabolic activity, but we did see an increase in swimming activity, which may indicate either neurodevelopment toxicity or transient behavior modification. Um, we need more essay to determine the precise effect here. Uh, at day six, the gene expression so far demonstrated very few modification. And I, like I said, I'm completing the day 30 uh, analysis right now. Um, our fish at day 30 um, had an increased BMI and an increase in diversity of adipose tissues. So they are bigger and they have more type of adipose tissues. And some individual developed a fatty liver. Um, if we conclude rapidly this project, the in vivo work that we did with the fish come from most of the observation we did with the cell work, the in vitro work previously published. The main difference um, is really when we looked at our total mixture of inorganic and organic chemicals. In the cell, the mixture had a higher effect, a more potent effect than the individual chemicals. However, in our fish, um, the total mixture, we're losing the effects of the individual chemicals, mainly of the inorganic, if we looked at the behavior, for example. Um, so overall, a mixture effect does not always represent the individual chem chemical effect in vivo. Um, there's a lot of future direction that I would like to take with this project. Um, recently, I was awarded an NSERC funding. Uh, this project aims to elucidate the role of PFAS um, and how PFAS disrupt AHR and disrupt metabolic health to create issues such as um, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or the toxic and associated fatty liver disease. I am currently working on the first aim uh, where I used similarly to what we published previously, but where I use um, adipocyte differentiation assay to measure lipid accumulation and proliferation of cytotoxicity. I am to do a chromatinib immunoprecipitation assay to go a little deeper and understand um, how AHR activate, which pathways AHR is activating uh, after exposure to PFAS and how these activation leads to metabolic health issues. Um, I am really soon starting the second aim, which is to understand the effect of PFAS in um, developmentally exposed zebra fish. Uh, I want to do conduce similar essay to what we did in this project that I just presented with metabolic health assessment at day six and day 30, and also either gene expression or sequencing of those fish. And furthermore, because we did see those fatty liver fish, this is a more general future direction of where I would like my research to lead and uh, hopefully my future lab. Um, I would like to push this a little further in the fatty liver issues um, and in the cell aims. Instead of using adipocyte, I would like to use hepatocyte to understand their differentiation process and how they accumulate lipids in the liver. Um, similar essays to understand maybe a little more of molecular mechanism through the HR signaling and fish aims. Um, also understanding a little bit more of the developmental um, processes of those fish affected by PFAS or emerging chemicals and how they lead to fatty liver issues. Oops. <laughs> and in conclusion, um, 
I would highly suggest that you clean your house mainly to avoid disrupting your um, metabolic homeostasis. And I know our results seem to demonstrate that the total mixture had mitigated effect. Um, however, keep in mind that we only use seven chemicals and household dust can contain up to hundreds of chemicals that we did not study um, in this project. So there's still a lot more research that needs to be done to really understand the effect of chronic exposure from EDCs from your household dust. And uh, before the end, there's a lot of people involved in that project. Um, the co-authors of this work, mainly um, Aisha, Pranit, and Daria, which are undergrad in the lab that helped me tremendously with the fish exposure, weighing, and imaging, and also the RNA isolation. Um, I want to thank Dr. Mathieu Lefeau, which was a postdoc in the lab that helped me also with this project at the beginning. And of course, Dr. Sotis, uh, who supports me every day in this project and more. Um, we have a lot of uh, funding agencies for the project. Uh, my NSERC postdoctoral award is funding me. And of course, I want to thank you all for being here and the uh, CIAP for the award. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Roxanne, for a very interesting talk. Um, join me once again in congratulating uh, Roxanne on her uh, award, as well as the NSERC award. So congratulations on that as well. Um, and the floor is open for uh, questions at this point. Um, so please, once again, raise your hand in the, in the chat um, so I can see who has the most pressing questions. Maybe once again. Oh, Isabel. Okay. Go ahead, yeah, Isabel. maybe I can start this time. And it's probably a, a question that you have quite a bit and probably uh, you know the answer, I'm pretty sure. But like what, when you're looking at the fish, I know that in young fish, you cannot sex the fish, but probably the older animal, what is happening? Is there a sex difference here? Uh, it's like, especially when you think about like obesity and so on, there's some sex difference in, uh, in the population. So how about your fish? That's a great, great question. And we did talk about it a lot in the lab. Um, the problem with zebrafish is that they're not a precise sex genes like we have in human. Um, it's a little more complicated. And I think there's only one study that measured different genes in um, zebrafish to understand, to, to determine their sex at 30 days. So before 30 days, there's nothing we can do. Um, at 30 days, yeah, there's six genes that we can measure. So we did not do that quite yet. Um, but to understand, I think, deeper the effect and the adipose accumulation, I think it would be very important and necessary, especially also with the fatty liver. One of my aims would be to relate the fatty liver issues to the sex of those fish. Yeah, and when you 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 were looking at your PCR and so on, you have a quite quite a lot of variation. And that might just be explained by the fact that you have female and males here that are um, reacting differently to the treatment, basically. Probably. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. the deep 30 fish, we could sex them, but as I said, we have so many treatments that it's not an easy yeah. task. <laughs> no, I know we're, we're starting to work with zebra fish and yeah, we, I know I, we cannot, you cannot sex them before a certain age and it's, it's a little bit more complicated than mice and rats and so on. Thanks. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Maybe in between, um, I had a very similar question for you, actually, and um, I agree. So, you know, the, the variance in the data might be linked to sex differences. Have you thought of, so I think the 30-day time point, and of course, the sexual differentiation in, in fish and zebrafish, you know, occurs sort of or finishes around three, four months, depending on, on how you feed them, how they grow. Have you thought of taking the exposures a bit longer as well? So is, is 30 sort of your final time point? And would it be worthwhile looking at, you know, further development? But I guess you would also have then, of course, the influence of ovarian development and different investment and things like that, right? Yeah, the um, sex development in zebrafish is influenced by many environmental factors, so we need to be careful with that. Um, it would be really interesting to push these fish further, but I think for time and space, um, it, they would need to be separated and kept individually if we really want to follow their their sex. Um, so that is not an easy task, but it would be, it would be, I think, the next step to answer all our questions, definitely. Great, thank you. Melanie has a question. Hi, Roxanne. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really nice to to see it and listen about your your results. I can't wait to to read the paper. 
And um, I was just wondering, because I, I get really interested in everything that is um, endocrine disruptive effects uh, alone or by themselves versus the mixture and how it changes completely the way they're affecting us, metab being metabolized and everything. So it's it's more of an exploratory question, philosophical question, I guess. <laughs> but like, what would you do or, or what do you, do you think it's the key to kind of fill in that gap of what we're seeing in individual components and make sure like how, because for me, I, I'm not able to understand what can we put in between to to kind of make them fit together and, and make it a logical pr process. Yeah, there's no easy answer to that, but I think what would really help would to do would be to do some omics, proteomics and genomics. And I think that would give us a, maybe a more global answer. Um, but other than that, yeah, I think more mixture studies are necessary in understanding how these chemicals interact. Like we're not um, doing that here. So maybe they have some interaction in between them and that creates that loss of effect from the inorganics to the organics. I know in oil study, it's a little bit of the same. There is a lot of metals in the petroleum and in oil, but the effect of these chemicals are barely uh, never studied in oil exposure because they're just not there. So yeah, chemical interaction for sure is an interesting avenue to take and omics to understand the bigger picture of what's happening in there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think your microphone is uh, off. Yes, it is muted. So okay. I was just going to ask, are there any more questions? Thanks, Roxanne. Uh, for Roxanne right now at this point, um, if not, we're running a bit late, not because of the speakers, but because we're waiting for um, everybody to arrive in the beginning. Does not to be the case. Um, so thank you once again. Congratulations. Um, and at this point, we'll take a, a short coffee break. Uh, so this was originally scheduled from uh, 2.10 to 2.20. And I would suggest maybe uh, from now till 2.30, if that's OK with everybody. And uh, we'll reconvene here very shortly. Thank you. Well, the next presentation is from Jan, who uh, received uh, the Professional Early Career Award. Um, Jan is a professor at the University of Ottawa, and he's, his research interests are the physiological consequences of developmental EDC exposure in adults, offspring, and multiple generations. He will present on the use of zebrafish as a model organism for the investigation of endocrine disruption. There you go. I will unshare my screen first. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'll just uh, quickly set up and share the presentation here. It's been a while since I've done online presentation. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so you should be hopefully able to see my screen. It looks good, and I'll try to get the laser pointer. I know it's always a bit uh, tricky as well. Okay, looks good. Great. Um, yeah, so thanks uh, once again for the introduction, um, and thank you very much for the award. It's a great honor and pleasure um, to be part of the society and to be recognized. It's really recognition of uh, uh, the staff in my lab, and so I'd like to uh, extend and uh, dedicate this, of course, uh, to all the contributors in my lab. So I'll start to just to give you get you oriented and to to jump right into it um, a brief overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next 25 minutes or so, um, and we've heard a lot about zebrafish already, um, and uh, more and more people are getting into this model, of course. But it's maybe taking a step back uh, for those of you who are, who are more rodent based or um, work in other uh, comparative models. Um, I'd like to start with a very short one or two slides history of zebrafish, so how they became a research model and uh, why they are particularly suited, in my opinion and others' opinion, as a as model system for endocrine disrupting chemicals. And uh, I will then, of course, um, discuss, and sorry, I'm just minimizing the, the videos here if I can, um, discuss some case studies uh, from my laboratory. Um, these deal with bisphenol A, uh, first and foremost. So that's an acute and long-term metabolic consequence study 
on developmental exposure to bisphenol A, so a very widely known and long known uh, endocrine disruptor with uh, estrogenic, among other um, activities. And then I'll talk about uh, apical metabolic and molecular consequences of um, uh, PFAS. So we already heard about some of these fluorinated uh, forever chemicals. And so um, we'll I'll continue in this theme in the vein and, and building a bit on what uh, Roxanne already discussed as well. And I'll conclude today um, by providing a few uh, future perspectives as well um, in the general field, um, in my view, of um, why zebrafish are important for endocrine disrupting chemical research and uh, what some of the advantages and future directions um, and opportunities really are. So as promised, very short history, won't spend too much time on it, but I think it's uh, useful to take a step back. Um, so zebrafish, um, and this became uh, quite clear in Dr. Trudeau's talk already, are a great model um, for fishes, first of all, um, because they're a member of the largest bony fish family. Uh, these are the cyprinid fishes, so it's the family of carps and minnows. And this is actually um, the um, so characterized by a lot of different species. So it's really a good representative model also from an ecotoxicological and, uh, and aquatic toxicological uh, point of view. Um, it's originally native to India and South Asia, but was then used um, uh, as an aquarium fish and uh, introduced into research by George Streisinger at the University of Oregon, who famously um, screened a few different model systems, including Medaka and other fish, but then decided and settled on zebrafish for some obvious advantages I'm going to discuss. And he used these fish for genetic basis um, in, in a screen, a mutational screen, um, to use a vertebrate model um, and uh, study neuronal development um, of these mutants, so a forward genetic screen type of uh, approach. This work was then furthered by a, a famous um, German zebrafish researcher, um, Christine Nusslein Vollhardt. Um, so she's um, uh, at the Max Planck, or was at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, in Germany, uh, and some of her uh, former students and trainees. And they collaborated uh, in an uh, enlarged and, and even larger mutational screen. Uh, introducing 4,000 mutations or so and taking advantage of this really rapid development uh, with translucent zebrafish embryos to study what these mutations would do to the embryo development. And so this is really why zebrafish became a popular model. Um, this was then complemented um, as one of the first fish um, to have their genome or its genome sequenced. It was initiated by the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute 2001. And so today we have a really well annotated uh, genome that offers, of course, a lot of opportunities that many of you uh, know about, and a few of which we'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about today as well. So then again, for the uh, non-initiated, a few advantages uh, of the zebrafish model. Um, so Daniel Rario is the, the Latin name, the scientific name. They are small, and this becomes important, of course, for the limited space, maintenance costs. We can um, increase throughput, um, look at larger sample sizes. Uh, and they have high fecundity. So we, in the lab at least, uh, we can control their um, the embryogenesis or the, the embryo rear, um, um, production. So really a good advantage um, uh, in its own right. Um, they develop rapidly, as I mentioned, and just to give you a context here, the organogenesis completed by five DPF. So only five days from fertilization of the egg, which occurs of course externally, uh, until um, full organogenesis and uh, free swimming zebrafish after hatching. Uh, so a remarkably rapid development. And of course, as I mentioned, they're translucent, um, which is why they were initially used as a developmental model. They're genetically tractable. I talked about some of the forward genetics. And of course, and this is quite popular now, um, it's a model for reverse genetics. So you can think of knockouts like CRISPR-Cas9, reporter lines you can introduce to maybe um, monitor and, and study um, endocrine um, cells. Um, so quite important tools that uh, nicely complement these uh, historical forward um, genetic approaches and, of course, benefit from our knowledge um, of, the, of the genome here. Um, it's, of course, sequenced and well annotated. And uh, as I mentioned, it's a good fish model, but it's equally uh, important in biomedical research. Um, so it's increasingly used uh, in this realm in, in diverse studies. And this is because 70% of the human genes have a zebrafish ortholog. So quite a nice number. It's a vertebrate species that we can use in early development. Um, so quite a few advantages. And because it's an important fish model, but also an important biomedical model, it's really well suited um, and appropriate for sort of one health concept. And this came again through in the previous two talks, can use it for environmental studies and ecotoxicology as a fish model, as a representative of a large family of fishes, but also, of course, um, as a proxy um, and, uh, and probing some of the mechanism, uh, mechanisms underlying uh, human health. So this is the One Health uh, concept, of course. And more recently, and this is true for many legislations, um, zebrafish uh, in the pre-feeding stages, so anything 
um, until after hatching and before uh, commencing exogenous feeding, so when the yolk reserves are resorbed, um, these stages are exempt from traditional vertebrate animal research regulations. And uh, this is important. So they are nicely uh, complementary um, to cell culture models that are becoming um, increasingly mandated through, through regulations. So think of the Bill S5 in Canada and other legislations as well. Uh, the three R's, so we reduce, uh, remove, and refine the methodology. But it's very nice and important, of course, especially in endocrine research, um, where we study the interaction of different um, tissues and the hierarchical um, regulation via hormones, uh, to have an in vivo model um, that can be scaled to high throughput uh, and be used um, in, in, this, uh, in this vein. So a couple of quick advantages um, just to um, sort of put that uh, out there. Um, very briefly, um, this uh, slide here illustrates uh, these uh, these types of um, advantages um, and uh, looks quickly and recapitulates very quickly um, the endocrine um, development. Oh, not the endocrine, sorry. Um, I'm just moving here to the, these slides. Very quickly uh, recapitulates that's better, um, the uh, zebrafish development. So in, inside here, you can see um, the, the time scale uh, ranging from zero hours. So the, the first scale is hours um, to the first day. Um, and this is really from uh, zygote and uh, genome activation all the way to the pharyngula period. Um, at two to three days, these fish then hatch, um, so leave their chorion um, and become free swimming. They still have yolk sac reserves um, and they use those up in a mixed uh, period. They commence um, exogenous feeding, but still have yolk sacs, uh, which is then um, completely resorbed around five days post fertilization. And so this is really the period that's exempt from these uh, legislations, as we heard earlier, there's then a prolonged, um, uh, so organogenesis is completely um, completed by this stage, and we have a maturation of the endocrine axis, so really nice uh, aspects for this for this model for organizational um, uh, effects of, uh, of endocrine uh, axes and, and, and hormones. And this moves then on to um, uh, sexual maturation, which takes um, three to four months, depending on other conditions. And so that's a bit of a longer um, process, but at three or four um, months, these fish can then reproduce and be bred for, for future generations. And we already heard about the use of zebrafish or for zebrafish in multi-generational aspects, of course, as well. So moving then to why um, this model is particularly suited to uh, endocrine disruption research. Um, like many good ideas, um, we're not the, the first ones to, uh, to um, embark on this. And uh, we're also not the only ones, nor will we be. Um, so I'm just showing um, a first um, uh, um, context here where this concept was really very clearly uh, formulated by Helmut Segner um, from the Center of Fish and Wildlife Health at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, and he proposed them using the zebrafish um, with its many advantages that were already evident in 2008 um, as a model system for endocrine disruption. I think since then, uh, we've made great advances in terms of uh, the endocrine regulation. So understanding the maturation of these axes, the timeline early on in development, and many of the relevant traits that are, of course, uh, regulated to a large extent by hormones, such as metabolism and growth, um, the stress axis, reproduction, are increasingly well characterized. And we have better and better methodology um, to also um, decrease detection limits for hormones that are relevant to measure in small sample sizes and, and blood volumes, for example, um, or at the tissue level, um, which were previously limiting for this uh, particular species compared to larger fishes. Um, so definite more advantages in the, uh, in the same vein that uh, are, are useful. Um, as I mentioned, per definition, of course, the endocrine regulation uh, bridges different tissues and coordinates organismal responses. So it's really nice under the 3R mandate um, to have a, a in vivo model system that allows um, ethical and economically viable investigation um, of uh, EDCs and, and uh, endocrine function. And so this allows us then in this time frame to look at organizational, potential activational, and even multi-generational effects, as we've heard, um, of EDCs. And uh, added advantages, I briefly talked about the, the genome repertoire and the genetic tools we, we have. Uh, we can look at um, the action of uh, endocrine factors um, and probing them via pharmacological manipulation. So we can, in the water, um, use pharmacologic, pharmacological inhibitors of certain receptors. Um, we can use knockouts and generate knockouts to isolate or to get um, to the root of different um, endocrine pathways and their contribution and how they're activated potentially by specific EDCs. 
So with this um, brief introduction, so hopefully that was um, helpful, even if a bit um, uh, following the, the previous two presentations already, um, I'll dive into the two case studies um, and then um, move towards the, the final conclusion. So the first case study is bisphenol A, uh, really poster child of an endocrine disrupting chemical, um, widely pop uh, popularized as an estrogenic um, EDC. Um, there's already regulation uh, in, in, in terms of many products and, um, and uh, uh, legislatures limiting uh, particularly developmental bisphenol A um, exposure. And so in this um, particular experiment uh, that was initiated by Ruben Martinez, um, a student, a PhD, now PhD student, now Dr. Martinez, who had at the time uh, come from Spain uh, on three occasions um, to collaborate with us uh, on his thesis, looking at EDCs in, in zebrafish, as we came from Spain, from Dr. Laya Navarro's uh, Navarro Martinez uh, lab. So he exposed these fish um, from two to five um, days post fertilization, so that's the exposure period, to three concentrations of bisphenol A. So you can see 0 0.1, uh, 1.0, up to 4.0 milligrams per liter. Um, and he also used um, a positive estrogenic control to probe the mode of action, see if there was uh, phenocopying of, uh, of effects. And this is the very potent uh, estrogen uh, ethanyl estradiol um, active in, in Telios fishes at 10 nanograms per liter. So included that as, a, as an estrogenic positive control. And so at these different stages, um, he looked at different assays, some of which were already introduced by Roxanne. So I don't need to uh, spend too much time reintroducing them. Um, he characterized organismal metabolic phenotyping, so more apical endpoints, and also looked at targeted gene expression of metabolic genes. He then, following this exposure period, um, transferred them to, to clean water, um, assessed morphometric parameters at 29 um, days post fertilization, so up to one month, and then followed them uh, up to 43 or 49 uh, days post fertilization. Um, and in this period, he also separated the groups and challenged them with um, um, a higher feeding regime, so twice the amount of, uh, of feed, to see if BPA, developmental BPA, would have a programming or organizational effect that had been reported in, uh, uh, in mammalian models previously. And to just show you uh, some of these results, so we're starting with um, the early um, developmental or acute exposure period here. Um, there was a reduction in feed intake, which can be measured as fluorescently labeled food um, in, these, in these larvae. And this was dose dependent, uh, reaching significance compared to control only in the 4.0 um, or 4 milligram per liter bisphenol A group. Um, it looks like it's mimicked by E2. E2 itself is not significantly different. On the right hand side here in, in uh, uh, graph B in panel B, um, we have an energy expenditure assay uh, that was explained by Roxanne. So it's the Alamar Blue assay, which uses a colorimetric reaction to measure NADH levels um, that are, of course, generated through uh, TCA, so the, the tricarbordin, uh, the PrEP cycle, um, as equivalence for um, oxidative phosphorylation. And so it's an indirect measurement uh, to measure oxygen metabolism related uh, energy expenditure. And we can see that in the uh, highest groups, so again, BPA uh, four um, and one milligram per liter, significant increase um, not matched in this instance um, by E2 um, or the lowest concentration of BPA, which were not different from control. We then also used um, the assay, um, again, introduced by Roxanne beforehand, uh, which is a light dark cycle, um, so widely used zebrafish locomotor assay. This uh, is based on the fact that zebrafish levels, zebrafish very reproducibly um, induce um, hyperlocomotion in um, following dark phases. And so you can see these sort of um, peaks um, after an acclimation period where the, the activity generally goes up, the total distance that is traveled. And what you can appreciate from this graph that overall um, in both light and dark phases for the high BPA concentrations, there was a significant decrease in locomotion form of energy expenditure as well. Uh, this was only partially mimicked uh, by the estrogenic control, 10 nanograms per liter E2. And so overall, these organismal level endpoints um, show some clear cut acute effects in early development in these, uh, in these larvae. Uh, and these are only partially, um, if at all, mimicked by EE2, suggesting uh, potentially non-estrogenic modes of action um, on uh, metabolism and in the mode of action of uh, metabolic disruption here. So a similar pattern was then found in um, a few genes. We investigated and targeted PCR analysis. And these are whole embryos. And um, we selected a few genes involved in lipid metabolism and carbohydrate metabolism, so important substrates um, for energy metabolism, 
uh, apolipoproteins A and B. So both are involved in mobilizing yolk reserves and lipids and also transporting lipids, of course, in the adult organisms. Um, HKDC is hexokinase uh, domain containing one. Um, so hexokinase is the first step of um, uh, glucose um, uh, glycolysis, for example, in muscle tissue where it phosphorylates glucose um, and commits it to um, intracellular uh, utilization. Um, phosphoglycerates um, uh, mutase to uh, another enzyme that's part of the glycolysis pathway. And in all of these, you can um, essentially see that there were inductions um, or um, inhibitions or, or reduced expression that were specific to these high BPA groups um, and not mimicked in any of these instances um, by E2, our positive um, estrogenic uh, control. So quite similar to what we observe um, at the organismal level. Um, I also added a marker that we profiled. Um, this is brain aromatase. Um, it's a used marker. Um, because it's an estrogen responsive, very estrogen responsive gene. And so we use this to get a sense of whether um, internally um, BPA um, exerts estrogenic effects. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side that the E2 significantly induces um, this, this enzyme as expected, um, but it's only the highest concentration of BPA in our um, uh, dose response or, or uh, concentration ranges here um, that exert these estrogenic effects. So overall, Similarly to the organismal level acute endpoints, we see that um, these effects, there are effects on metabolic genes, organismal endpoint metabolism and acute exposure, but these do not seem to be mimicked um, by estrogen, so likely not um, estrogen dependent. So we then followed, um, or he then followed um, the um, uh, uh, fish up to a period of about one month, or 29 DPF and measured um, body length, body weight, um, and then calculated the, the BMI, um, so the milligram per centimeter squared. And this can be shown in the top graph here, panel A. Um, so these uh, x-axis and y-axis do not root in zero, just for better resolution. But you can appreciate that um, there are changes, even though not significant in body length, but uh, significant and robust changes in the uh, all concentrations of BPA, 0.1, 1.0, and 4. Um, that increase body weight um, in these fish um, after the exposure had uh, has stopped for for several weeks. Um, however, um, again, uh, these uh, exposures were not uh, e two um, e two mimicked, um, so e two was not different from control. And I think visually you can appreciate that fairly clearly in this uh, in this panel A. And then um, we did follow these fish um, further along um, towards uh, uh, sexual maturation, uh, to forty five dpf. And this was, of course, also to, as I mentioned, to induce um, um, a higher diet um, component, so twice the feeding regime of the commercial diet that, that is used. Um, and interestingly, these results, these differences that we see at 30 dpf um, disappeared in both the controls, so that were not um, uh, challenged with this diet. Um, we did see a diet effect throughout the groups, as expected. So the more um, uh, they feed, the, the larger and the longer they get. Um, so these are the significant diet effects here and body length and body weight. But there is uh, notably no interaction effect, uh, which is actually um, opposite of what we see in some mammalian models where there is uh, reported programming effects um, on these um, uh, body weight parameters and uh, parameters including appetite. So just to show that um, there are useful aspects, of course, but also it's important to keep in mind that there might be differences in terms of these uh, longitudinal studies um, that might be different between fish and mammalian species. So we then integrated all these endpoints uh, in a principal component analysis um, that explained uh, with these two components, uh, roughly 60% of the variance observed. And you can appreciate at the four to six days post-fertilization um, that the controls are different, especially from the high concentrations of BPA, um, which cluster um, sort of in the, in the bottom quadrant here um, and the bottom left quadrant, but they're also different from E2. So overall suggesting that these metabolic effects, transient or not, or acute, um, do not uh, likely depend on uh, E2, uh, which does not mimic these, uh, these types of effects. So moving on then um, to another group of compounds we already um, heard about, and these are the PFOS, fluorinated compounds for every chemicals um, that of course have started to become legislated. And we started our work on these compounds with a visiting scholar, uh, Wang Quin Tu, um, was a professor in, in China um, who visited the lab uh, from 2018 to 2019. And he was interested particularly in comparing 
relatively known effects of PFAS, sort of the model uh, PFAS uh, a compound, um, to um, alternatives that are particularly um, prevalent in the Chinese market and the Chinese environment. So these are F53B, shown here in the middle, um, structurally quite similar, but somewhat modified to circumvent legislation. So there's an ether group that's added. You see a substitution of a chloride atom, atom compared to the, um, the fluoride, and also OBS. Um, so both um, compounds that have been detected, some of these are also detected in travel as, as quite persistent compounds, so F53B in lower concentrations than PFAS, but it's also detected in, uh, in polar bears, for example, in tissues. So there's also some sort of persistency and, uh, and concern on, on, on that front. These compounds are used, um, F53B in the chrome plating industry as a mist suppressant, OBS um, largely in oil fields, um, so it's a component of firefighting foams. Um, and so these reach quite uh, high levels in the Chinese environment. So he's particularly interested in comparing um, these uh, the biological effects of these compounds to PFOS or, or reference compound. So we have a similar, uh, or he did a similar experimental design, um, looking at a developmental exposure here from zero to four DPF. And again, looked at a developmental and morphometric uh, endpoints, then organism level metabolic endpoints and very specific molecular level um, metabolic endpoints. Um, at the at the gene transcript level, and additionally, in collaboration with um, um, uh, quantitative um, or um, chemists um, and experts in, in quantifying these compounds, we also looked at bioconcentration factors um, to get a sense of the um, matching internal dosage of these these compounds. And this uh, is shown um, here essentially. So you can see the three groups. Um, so in pink, you have the PFOS compounds. In yellow. Uh, the F53B compound at different concentrations tested, and OBS in the uh, blue um, color, highlighted in the blue color. And you can see that um, the concentrations used were somewhat similar for PFOS and F53B, higher for OBS, um, owing to the fact that uh, we already had preliminary data knowing that these um, would accumulate somewhat less. And so we achieved with these different concentrations tested somewhat similar um, uh, concentration ranges uh, internally. Um, but you can see also at the bottom that there are concentration dependent differences in the bioconcentration factor between these compounds, which if we had compared um, similar concentrations could have of course explained or confounded um, some of these, uh, these results. So then looking at um, endpoints I introduced earlier, um, we have um, a fluorescent based assay on, on feed intake shown on the left here. And you can see that there's a dose dependent reduction in PFOS and especially F53B that reaches significance with the lowest concentrations tested. Um, and in absence, um, even though there's a trend at the higher concentrations of any effect on, on appetite suppression um, in terms of OBS. On the right-hand side, um, we have conversely increased energy expenditure. Again, no effect on OBS on the right-hand side, um, but sort of similar, quite similarly looking effects on PFOS and the F53B compound that arguably looks structurally uh, more similar as well. So this points to organism level uh, discrepancy in, in reducing energy intake in these free feeding larvae at that stage. Um, there's an energetic cost of oxidative metabolism associated with them. So that suggests um, a potential metabolic challenge in these early um, stages. We then looked again at um, a few different um, target genes, in this case, glucokinase, so it belongs to the hexokinase family, um, especially um, important in liver and brain for glucose uptake in the first step of glycolysis. And this had actually been reported, interestingly enough, um, in the literature as a very potentially potent um, PFOS marker. And we found that its expression was um, robustly um, reduced, uh, not only in PFOS and F53B and in all concentrations, but also in OBS. And this was confirmed in, in Western blotting. Um, they pooled a large number of pooled embryo samples. You can appreciate sort of a dose dependent uh, reduction in the protein levels here as well. On the right-hand side, we probed a uh, specific transcript involved in fatty acid uh, import in the mitochondria. So this is the substrate or the rate limiting enzyme for uh, fatty acid oxidation. So an important metabolic pathway that's oxygen dependent in the mitochondria as well, of course. Um, and you can see that there were um, somewhat less clear dose um, dependent responses with these three concentrations, at least we tested, uh, but a suppression of these uh, CPT um, um, gene um, uh, transcript abundances as well. So we looked um, at endocrine regulators because uh, a lot of these uh, transcripts um, are regulated by insulin. Uh, it's an important trans uh, transcriptional regulator of many um, metabolic pathways, notably 
uh, with often opposing inhibitory and stimulatory effects towards more anabolism and uh, inhibiting catabolism. Um, and while we did see um, sort of a tendency um, for um, suppression of insulin expression, there are two paralogs in zebrafish, in A and in B. Um, this did not reach um, statistical significance. However, uh, it's important to note that these are whole embryo, um, and so uh, it's not necessarily the, the most precise measurement. Uh, it's, it's certainly the most convenient. Um, but for example, using this example of INS A and INS B, um, there are different roles in development that they play. INS B is more restricted to the pancreas, um, so the beta cells, uh, the pancreatic beta cells, the um, endocrine cells. Um, whereas INS A also has a wider spread and, and different um, expression patterns. And so to um, address this in, in future studies, and I'm going to talk about sort of future directions uh, in, in a bit, we started um, generating in collaboration with uh, Jenny Bruin, uh, who's interested in, uh, in PFAS um, effects on, on metabolism using mammalian models. She's a professor at Carleton University here in Ottawa. Um, we started generating zebrafish lines uh, with a plasmid construct. And you can see here, um, our first successes with this is that we can label pancreatic cells um, and use those as a more targeted um, um, readout um, for potential endocrine disrupting effects on these cells themselves, their morphology and their development um, in acute exposures. And just to show you um, how these approaches can be quite promising. So remember, I talked to you about um, the, the, the promise of these uh, uh, um, genome um, and, and genome editing approaches and the, the, the repertoire we have in zebrafish. This is from a collaboration with a departmental colleague, uh, Mark Ecker, um, who's interested, who has interest in, in uh, dopaminergic neurons. And um, this study was done with one of his grad students, Michael Kalin. And it followed um, the finding that uh, PFOS, um, notably um, at, at quite environmentally relevant or lower concentration, um, reduced dopamine levels in several um, uh, species, including frogs in the environment. And so this raised, of course, concerns um, regarding their role, um, also with regard to biomedical sort of uh, disease uh, etiology. Um, so their interest is in using the zebrafish model as a model for Parkinson's disease. So we joined forces here and uh, harness these techniques um, because we obviously also had um, invested interest in, in energy expenditure, locomotion, and then potentially underlying mechanisms um, that uh, that could explain or at least uh, point to the direction um, of a, of a um, um, initiating point for these effects. And so what you can see here, again, you have the light dark um, alternating larval locomotor assays that are widely used. Um, we exposed to PFOS at different concentrations. Um, and they were, of course, light and dark phases, F53B and OBS. And we saw um, particularly strong total distance reduction um, in the higher concentrations of PFOS and F53B. And again, OBS seemed to be somewhat less, uh, less active, but there were significant um, effects at 0.1 as well. Um, not shown here, so you can translate that to velocity as well, which correlated fairly well with the overall distance moved. Um, not shown here is also the short distance. So with these um, types of programs, you can also look at um, particular types of, of uh, locomotion. And while the overall total distance was decreased, there was an increase in, in uh, short distance, sort of uh, short bursts of activity. Uh, they were a bit re reminiscent potentially um, of, uh, of seizures and or Parkinson-like um, symptoms, if you want, in this uh, in this particular model. So we then looked at different brain areas in development, um, and there are some uh, advances that have been made in the zebrafish model. I mentioned it's a biomedical model as well, where they looked at particular dopaminergic uh, neurons and, and areas um, that um, uh, correlate or are believed to be homologous, um, or first of all, involved in locomotor behavior, and second, are believed to be homologous with um, the substantia nigra and might be important. This has been shown in ablation, chemical ablation studies, um, that link sort of a decrease in these um, dopaminergic neurons with um, uh, locomotor output. And what you can appreciate here is that in quantifying blindly these, uh, these uh, new uh, newly born dopaminergic neurons, you can see that there's a decrease uh, from DMSO over to one milligram in PFOS, um, F53B as well, but also OBS. So suggesting, uh, if not a cause, at least a correlation um, in the dopamine uh, neuron birth and development 
um, and this locomotor phenotype. So just an illustration, even though this is more maybe oxidative stress related, these dopamine neurons are quite sensitive to, to oxidative stress rather than endocrine disruption. It's, it's, a, it's a point in case to show that this insulin line we're, we're trying to develop might be quite fruitful um, in these types of uh, analyses and endeavors. So then switch uh, gears um, a little bit and quickly move, um, I'll dedicate the last uh, few slides here um, to uh, a more recent direction we've taken uh, in collaboration with departmental colleague, Carol York uh, and Jason O'Brien at Environment and Climate Change Canada. And uh, Carol York's of course involved with Health Canada as well. So we're collaborating uh, with these um, uh, research labs, the governmental research labs um, in developing a zebrafish um, towards a higher throughput screen, medium to high throughput screen, standardizing these pipelines and uh, behaviors and, and endpoints um, I just explained um, to get maybe a sense or um, sort of a, a readout um, that might be ultimately useful for regulators. And again, the zebrafish model here is very useful uh, because the vertebrate model, it's in vivo, develops rapidly and it's exempt from uh, vertebrate um, restrictions in terms of uh, chemical exposures uh, and animal care protocols. So overall, this is a pipeline that was largely spearheaded by Jory Curry, a co-supervised uh, master's student uh, between Jason O'Brien and myself. Um, and he started um, exposing, uh, exposing and, and sort of standardizing this exposure um, period uh, from four hours post-fertilization to 120 hours post-fertilization between day zero and day five. Looked at um, three tiers of endpoints, overt toxicity, this is mortality, deformities, so obviously some uh, quite drastic and, and uh, higher level endpoints, more traditional endpoints that are also anchored in the OECD, the Zebrafish Embryo Acute Toxicity Test, for which there are international guidelines. But he supplemented these with endpoints um, such as swimming behavior I talked about, oxidative metabolism, dependent energy expenditure, and then um, with the harness and the expertise of uh, Dr. Yock and uh, Jason O'Brien, transcript level gene expression. And so the goal here um, is to derive uh, what's called points of departure, um, looking at more wider um, dose um, uh, concentration ranges um, to, to um, ideally identify a threshold dose. This can be done with uh, different approaches. The one we use is called benchmark dose and benchmark response. Um, so statistical methods to find a level at which um, a response that's different from, from background occurs. And this is then um, uh, determined to be a benchmark dose with uh, confidence intervals. And we can compare this uh, with different existing um, uh, BMDs or benchmark doses in the literature. And so this work was then furthered and applied um, these pipelines by a postdoc shared again uh, between the O'Brien, um, York, and, uh, and Maya, the Menigan lab. Um, and she exposed zebrafish to different PFAS compounds. Um, so as you may know, there's um, there are hundreds of compounds, so it's actually quite uh, quite complicated to assess them. Um, but starting somewhere, there's a few um, that are that are grouped and analyzed based on key chemical characteristics. Uh, so we have the um, the carbon chain length from C4 to C10. So chain length is one. You see the chemical nomenclature uh, of the PFOA as an example up here. And there are different um, uh, groups, uh, the, the eight, uh, eight the carbon in this case, or the, the different um, terminal C um, carbon chain uh, components. These are carboxylic groups and sulfonic acid groups, which chemically could behave, of course, um, differently and might have different um, effects. And so... Um, very briefly, um, um, I will uh, quickly, sorry, I just thought uh, didn't take uh, time into consideration here. Very briefly, um, if, if time hopefully permits, um, I will go over some of the work, um, the, the large amount and body of work that, that has been accomplished already and is continuing to be accomplished um, in this. Um, so at first, um, there was a new method called the um, S1500 panel, zebrafish panel. Um, which is called TempoSeq. Um, so this is a reduced representation um, of the zebrafish genome, about 10%. And these are handpicked genes that are endocrine genes, developmentally important genes uh, by zebrafish toxicology experts. And these can be used to interrogate um, uh, gene expression at, the, at an omics level. It's a few advantages um, without going into too many details um, of this methodology compared to RNA-seq. Um, cost efficiency might be one. Um, there are other um, uh, advantages in terms of preparation of, uh, of the, the libraries and, and things like that for, for sequencing. So in the first study um, that was um, 
uh, is now published by uh, by Hyojin Lee and, and was led by Carol York um, uh, and, and and a wide range of collaborators and uh, and Jason O'Brien. Um, we sought to uh, first apply um, or identify what the false discovery uh, rates were. So in other words, what's the best sample size of zebrafish embryos and exposures to pool um, and how many replicates are best used uh, to avoid false positives? And so this was important because a new method uh, applied in a new um, uh, organism, the zebrafish. And so what you can see here in this graph is uh, really a reiteration of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, experimental concept. So what Hyojin did, uh, um, Hyojin Lee, the, the postdoc, she exposed all zebrafish to just DMSO, uh, the same concentration, and assigned um, different mock concentration groups um, to these uh, DMSO uh, treated embryos, and they were treated the same. So by definition, there should ideally be no uh, differentially expressed genes. And uh, maybe intuitively, you can see then these uh, analysis of differentially expressed genes um, uh, scale. Um, so th there were a thousand bootstraps um, uh, applied to these to these uh, identification of, of DEGs and the pipeline. And you can somewhat intuitively see um, uh, that uh, looking at the pool sizes on top, PO1, PO5, P10, and P20, so these are 20 embryos pooled, one embryo pooled, that you have a larger chance for false positives or more biological variability, if you want, at the P1s. It makes intrinsic sense. So you have more variability in individuals than when you reduce that noise in pooling 20. You can also see that there are sample sizes uh, ranging from three to nine um, or 10 um, within these uh, different pools. And within each of these graphs, you can also see that maybe somewhat expectedly, um, these uh, false positives decrease with a higher amount of, uh, of replicates. And so Eugene was able to identify sort of a sweet spot um, with the pools of five and, and sample sizes higher than, than six or seven, after which there was not more significant uh, advantages gained. And she used that then as her um, new um, approach and, and parameters that she defined. And so uh, in some of the work um, uh, that, that she's uh, done since on the PFAS, she exposed a group of eight different PFAS compounds. Um, so exposed the zebrafish to eight different PFAS compounds um, and looked at different endpoints uh, shown here on the, on the right that I mentioned. So the EC50 is the overt toxicity endpoint. Um, the behavioral endpoints are shown in red in this panel three here at the bottom. And the transcriptomic endpoints, um, so the benchmark dose at which there's significant increase in, uh, in, in dose responsive um, differentially expressed genes relative to controls is indicated in blue. And what you can see in this preliminary data is that um, there's a, a clear um, sort of difference in responding and non-responding uh, PFASs. Um, so with lower concentrations for some, shown here at the bottom, uh, PFDS, PFOS, PFDA, uh, and lesser responsive ones, PFOA, PFHXS, PFHXA, PFBS, and uh, PFBA um, on the top. So where these things are only reached at higher concentrations, these endpoints. And um, what's also quite, quite evident is that there's um, sort of a level of biological organization that is relatively coherent um, throughout um, all of these. And this grouping doesn't change, um, but the sensitivity of the, the readout changes here. So using traditional OECD-based endpoints, you can see that there's um, a certain EC50 um, a value for these for these different compounds. It's the least sensitive, as would be um, expected in, in malformities and um, um, and behavior uh, and uh, and uh, lethality or, or death. And the behavior improves the sensitivity, um, so it, it, it keeps largely these these orientation of non-responsive versus responsive ones for those that were active. And the most sensitive, um, maybe somewhat unsurprisingly, but importantly, uh, and therefore protective um, uh, endpoint is gene expression, which could be seen as a biological response and uh, and uh, and a response to these PFOS, so biological activity that is induced. And to conclude, um, I asked Eugene to also briefly look at. Um, uh, some of the uh, enrichments. So of course, we can use these decks also to get some biological information in terms of pathways. Um, unsurprisingly, the uh, the responders um, that had more uh, differentially expressed genes have more pathways that are enriched. Uh, but I particularly um, asked her to look at endocrine systems for this uh, specific talk. And you can see um, that there are different functions and different PFASs that are um, characterized here. We're interested in metabolic disruption, um, EDC effects, potential EDC effects of these compounds and cell metabolism and function. And uh, what you can see here is um, the gene number um, that corresponds uh, to this gene set um, um, uh, 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 that is that is probed. Um, and on the endocrine system, you can see that there are 
um, a few compounds um, highlighted here on the top in, in, this, in this blue box uh, that are all similar chemically in that they're sulfonic acid groups uh, and have uh, carbon chain length that are higher than six um, that are active in terms of uh, endocrine uh, system uh, endpoints and, and, and go terms that you can, you can see here. And um, this is particularly evident for PFOS uh, with the highest hit in uh, adipose cytokine signaling pathway. We just heard in the previous talk about um, uh, the potential for, for PFAS to be obesogens. Structurally, they mimic um, fatty acids. And if you look at some of these target genes in the adipose cytokine signaling pathway on the right here, you can see that there are, first of all, um, a few candidates that actually directly interact with um, free fatty acids. And this is CPT1A, so importing fatty acids to the mitochondria that I talked about earlier in one of our targeted approaches. It's CD36, cellular importer of free fatty acids, and the PPARs, um, so the PPAR gammas, important in, in adipocyte um, development and also responsive to free fatty acids. Uh, so these types of things can be quite useful, um, of course, to, to see if there are structural similarities that, that dictate maybe um, obesogenic or other endocrine disrupting uh, function. And so just a, a quick um, sort of uh, overview of the potential for these types of um, uh, or added potential in terms of the uh, added benefit from benchmark doses um, for the biological interpretation um, and, and comparing in a higher screen these, these different compounds in there in this case, endocrine or metabolic activity. With this, um, I promise to conclude. I hope I didn't go over time too much. Um, um, and of course, as I mentioned, there are many, many interesting, exciting areas in terms of EDC work in the zebrafish model. Um, one is, of course, the exploration of mixture effects. Uh, again, we heard about that um, earlier as well. Um, we're particularly excited about um, developing lines um, as, as very specific um, interrogators of endocrine activity in these species. We can do this within a generation, adults, um, and across generations. So that's a very exciting uh, aspect. You only need two generations for intergenerational effects uh, since they're externally fertilizing. Uh, we can manipulate um, embryos, so we can look at uh, potential material that's packaged in sperm or egg cells, such as microRNAs, and see if we can develop markers that might explain um, or, um, or phenocopy these effects. Uh, and of course, we can use knockouts to investigate uh, hormone receptor dependency and EDC action to see if particular effects are abolished if we um, abolish specific receptors or pathways. So with this, I hope I... Um, um, got you more interested in the in the zebrafish model in endocrine disruption. Um, I'd like to, of course, acknowledge uh, SIAP and Dicida um, once again for the award. We had a very lovely meeting in Quebec City. Uh, so I encourage you um, to attend uh, in person if you can for the next editions of these meetings. So a host of people I'd like to thank, first and foremost, my students um, listed here. And of course, great collaborators, Dr. Jason O'Brien, Dr. Carol York, Dr. Laya Navarro-Martin. Um, who all contributed um, to, to the success. Um, and um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge diverse funding sources, of course, who uh, supported this research. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Jan, for the great presentation. Um, we are ahead of our time, so maybe we can like take one or two questions before going to uh, Vicky for the last presentation of the day. So please stay with us. If you have one question or two, you can put it in the chat or raise your hand. Yes, Carol, can go. That was fantastic, Jan. Thanks so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I wonder, could you comment on how we can get a, a better handle on sex-specific effects in that model? You you bugged Vance about this, and I've I've always wondered the same thing myself in the work that we're doing together. Yeah, it's a really it's a, it's a, it's a really good point. I think that the trade-off is a bit the state, right? So it's it's difficult because they they develop so everything else develops super quickly, and and that's really nice in this model, but the final sexual differentiation, of course, takes three months, right? Which is which is long, and so um, I guess one one question would be to find that spot of where maybe we can identify, you know, older larvae, um, but they're not quite three months old, um, and and sex them reliably. Uh, there's no simple genetic markers, uh, unfortunately, but there's some, of course, ovarian markers. And once this cascade kicks in, that we could use. The other aspect might be, you know, with some of these these lines. I mean, we could use adults and then isolate effects in specific cell lines or endocrine cell lines, I guess, if we sorted them or something like that. Um, so this could be another option. But I think in the early stages, it's it's difficult. Um, we, we can't do it yes, in the we, first five days. 
we could think about some single cell mm -hmm. sequences as well. Right. It, it gets really expensive really quickly, but for a few yeah. key experiments on some prototypical stressors or something. Yeah, and even even just to do, to identify a suit of genes that are you know sort of early markers of ovarian versus testicular differentiation and and how how early we can go. There's some single cell work out there for for ovarian uh, differentiation cell types, and so it'd be really worthwhile looking at how far back can we go and how close to this higher throughput capacity can we can we really bring it right. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I agree. I mean that would be of course really cool. Thanks. Yeah. Is there okay. any any questions? Last questions? No. Yeah, I have a I have a comment or question, but uh, for the sex difference thing, uh, two two ways you can do it. One is to to uh, stop using the weird lab version of zebrafish and go back to wild stocks where you can have a sex marker, uh, or you can uh, make a transgenic animal that la labels, uh, you know, certain primordial germ cells in one sex and the other, and then then you would know quite early. But it's it's not going to be at six days. Well, the other option, I think that's a good point, Vance. The other option might be, I think there's some mutations where you can generate maybe mostly male or female offspring, um, right? Sort of a mescalization yeah. or something like that. So that could be absolutely another another avenue to to look at. But of course, then you have the fun, confound of, of large organismal level effects. But yeah. Um, yeah, different different approaches. Or, I mean, there's, of course, hormonal treatment to <laughs> masculinize and feminize. But if you're interested in EDCs, you know, that would be an over. <laughs> it speaks the purpose, aspect. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the okay. question. Thank you, Jan, for your presentation. My you want to go? You want to go further with Vicky? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our um, final speaker, um, Vicky. Um, Vicky is a PhD student at McGill University, uh, and her doctoral research project is focused on the effects of chemicals that are being used as flame retardants and plasticizers. Um, on a multitude of phenotypic and functional endpoints in KGN human ovarian granulosa cells. So very excited to have a non-zebrafish talk here <laughs> as well today. Um, and the floor is all yours, uh, Vicky. Congratulations on the award. Yes, I'm going to share my screen now and just let me know if you can hear me well and see the slice. Yeah, can you see the slice? Yeah, looks good, Vicky. Yep, great. So thank you for the introduction and I'm very honored to receive the award and thanks for giving me this opportunity to share my research here. Um, and yeah, I'm doing my PhD with Dr. Barbara Hills and Dr. Bernardo Bear at McGill. And actually just at the end of last month, I completed my oral defense. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about part of my doctoral thesis project, which investigates the effects of organophosphate esters or OPEs on ovarian granulosa cells. Um, let me have my pointer. Yeah. Um, yeah. OPEs have been uh, widely used as replacement flame retardants and plasticizers, and they are now found everywhere in the environment and in many products that we're using in our daily life. But the bad news is these chemicals do not just stay in the products that they were added to, they readily leach out into the environment leading to human exposure. And indeed, OPEs have been found in various human matrices, including the urine, blood, hair, nails, and even breast milk, indicating a pervasive exposure to these chemicals. And it's relatively well established that OPEs can induce neurotoxicity, thyroid dysfunction, developmental toxicity, and they were shown to affect the function of liver, adrenal gland, bone, adipocytes. And many of these effects were mediated by the endocrine disrupting potential of OPEs. However, the reproductive toxicity of these chemicals was less clear. So there are um, a few but limited studies that investigated the effects of OPEs on female reproductive health. And often females were found to have a higher exposure level to these chemicals than males. So in vitro, we know that these chemicals could antagonize or agonize the activities of several 
human nuclear receptors, including the estrogen receptor and androgen receptors. And in vivo, we know that exposure to OPEs uh, alter the concentrations of sex hormones in the circulation, which may have led to abnormal estrocyclicity and impaired fertility of the exposed animals. And some epidemiological studies also uh, found an association between exposure to OPEs and reductions in successful fertilization, implantation, increased incidence of pregnancy loss, and reduce life birth, birth rates of the babies. So all these data suggest that exposure to OPEs may be detrimental to female reproductive health. However, the specific mechanism or the specific target cells um, remains largely unknown. So ovarian follicle is where the oocytes develop and granulosa cells are the endocrine cells that surround the oocytes they are responsible for synthesizing the sex steroid hormones like estrogen um, and progesterone. And the proper function of granulosa cells are important for the development of the follicles and thus the oocyte. And they're also essential for female fertility. So I just want to quickly mention that um, this blue structure indicates a fluid filled cavity in the ovarian follicle and also known as the antrum. Many environmental chemicals have been found in follicular fluid indicating a direct exposure of ovarian cells to these chemicals. So uh, my project, we are, uh, I'm very, I'm specifically interested in whether and how uh, OPEs may affect the function of granulosa cells. And I have chosen this KGN human granulosa cell line as my in vitro model. It was derived from a patient with granulosa cell car carcinoma, and it it's, uh, has multiple advantages. It preserves um, many characteristics that were observed in primary granulosa cells, and they form a stable and uniform cell population over the course of in vitro culture. So making KGN cells uh, um, a nice, uh, a great in vitro model. So this pie chart shows you the relative percentage weight of 13 OPEs that were found in over 85% of dust samples collected from Canadian houses. For the first part of my project, I have tested the effect of those OPEs that were found to have uh, more than 5% weight uh, in the sample, plus one major component of uh, um, commercial flame retardant mixture, Firemaster 600, and two additional OPEs that were found in high concentrations in other samples. And based on the presence of phenol rings, we can categorize the, uh, these uh, OPEs into two subgroups, the non tri or tri OPEs. By comparing their effects, we wanted to know whether structural characteristics may contribute to the toxicity of these chemicals. And their effects were also compared to a, a legacy brominative flame retardant that has been regulated, so BDE-47, which was used as a reference compound throughout the first half of my studies. So on top of everything that I've just told you, we hypothesized that exposure to OPEs will adversely affect the function of ovarian granulosa cells. And to test the hypothesis, I have four specific aims of the project. The first is to evaluate the effects of individual OPEs on the phenotype of KGN granulosa cells. And the second, to assess whether steroidogenesis in these cells uh, was affected. And the third is to determine how the transcriptome of KGN cells is modulated by OPEs. And the last, we determine the effects of OPE mixtures that um, was constructed based on the profile of OPEs found in Canadian house, house dust. Um, however, for the purpose of today's presentation, I'll be focusing on the first three aims of my project, which are investigating the effect of individual OPEs. But if you're interested in any of the mixture data, these data have been recently published in TalkSci, and I will be happy to talk about that after uh, the presentation or feel free to reach out to me about it. So to answer the first questions, the KGN cells were exposed for 48 hours to one of the chemicals at concentrations range between 0.001 to 100 micromolar. 
And then the cells were stained with different combinations of fluorescent dyes to visualize the important cellular features, for example, uh, lysosomes, lipid droplets, uh, uh, oxidative stress. Then the cells were imaged using this operator high content imaging system. The concentration response data were then analyzed using the benchmark modeling to calculate the concentrations that induced a 10% change from control. These data were also further analyzed using the, uh, the ToxPi analysis for potency ranking, and I will introduce this method um, shortly in my presentation. We also extrapolated these in vitro concentrations into in vivo doses, but due to the time limits, I will not uh, be able to share this part of results today. So here I'm showing you some uh, representative fluorescent images of the cells following TMPP exposure, one of the OPEs that we're interested in. We started to see some cytotoxicity at 10 micromolar of TMPP, as you can see, uh, it, as determined by the reduction in uh, the number of viable cells. We also observe a decrease in the number of lysosomes, shown as these yellow dots surrounding the nuclei. And we observe a drastic increase in lipid droplets, uh, stained uh, in green here, and also an increase in oxidative stress, shown as the uh, red staining. So this table summarizes my high content imaging data. Compared to the legacy compound BDE47, uh, a few OPEs uh, induce more prominent effects than BDE47, as you can tell by the darker color. So when there is a blue, it indicates a decrease, and when there is a yellow or orange, it indicates an increase. And we do identify a few OPEs that, uh, that were less active. To better compare their potencies, we calculated the BMC values um, and they were plotted on a log scale here. So each chemical was given a unique color. If we first look at the cytotoxicity, we can see compared to BDE47, many of these chemicals were actually comparably toxic or even more cytotoxic than the legacy compound. And if we further looked into other phenotypes that we have assessed, the first thing that we can notice is many of these phenotypic changes were observed at concentrations with no or low cytotoxicity. And also uh, compared to BD47, some OPEs targeted more phenotypes and at lower concentrations. On top of this, we were able to rank these chemicals based on their lowest observed BMC, and TMPP was ranked as the most potent chemical for, for its effects on the total area of lipid droplets. The legacy compound BD47 was ranked in the fourth place, and those OPEs that had no effect were accordingly ranked at the bottom. These data were then further analyzed using this ToxPi analysis, which ranks um, these chemicals based on their integrated effects on the eight phenotypes that we have tested. So each slice of this pie represents one phenotype, and the larger the slice area, it means the more potent the chemical is to affect the specific endpoint. And here are the results. Again, TMPP was ranked as the most potent chemical for its prominent effects on multiple phenotypes, and this was followed by two other tri OPEs, BPDP and IPPP. Again, BD47 was uh, in the fourth place, and those uh, chemicals that had no effects were accordingly ranked at the bottom. We then compared the rank orders determined with the two approaches, and we found a high correlation between the rank orders. So for example, TMPP was consistently ranked as the most potent chemical by the two approaches, and therefore it should be prioritized for further assessment. And those chemicals that had little to no effects were consistently ranked at the bottom, and they may be considered as candidates for safer alternatives. 
Just to conclude my first aim, we found that the key phenotypes of KGN cells were altered by OPEs, and some of them uh, induce a greater effect than the legacy compound BD47. And with the BMC and ToxPi analysis, we found that many triarrow OPEs are generally more potent than the non-triarrow OPEs. And then uh, my second aim is to assess whether OPEs affect the ability of these cells to synthesize steroids. Similar to my previous aim, the KGN cells were exposed for 48 hours to one of the chemicals, but this time in the presence or absence of a steroidogenic stimulus, dibutocycline EMP. And only five OPEs were chosen for this further analysis. Four of them were ranked in the top for their phenotypic effect, and one, um, one that was less active, TBOEP, and it's also uh, and the only non-triarrow LPEs that we have tested. So I collected the cell culture medium after the exposure and measured the basal or stimulated production of progesterone and estradiol in the cell culture medium using ELISA. Here I'm showing you the concentrations of progesterone uh, produced by 1 million cells under basal or stimulated condition, and they were plotted on two different y-axes. So first we can see the BD47 did not affect either the basal or stimulated production of progesterone. However, the five OPEs that we tested all significantly increase the basal production of progesterone, and two of them, IPPP and BPDP, reduce the, the response of KGN cells to the steroidogenic stimulus. Similarly, for the estradiol, again, BD47 had no effect, but all the five OPEs um, increase the basal production of estradiol and reduce the response of KGN cells to the steroidogenic stimulus. And we then wanted to know whether the alterations that we observed in, uh, in the hormone concentrations were associated with changes in key transcripts related to the steroidogenic pathways and cholesterol biothenesis. So I extracted the total RNA from the cells and qRT-PCR was done. Before going into the results, I just want to give a quick overview of the uh, two pathways that I'm interested in. Cholesterol is the precursor of all steroid hormones, and in vivo, the primary source of cholesterol uh, for granulosa cells would be the LDL-bound cholesterol from the circulation. And lipid droplets also serve as a readily accessible source uh, for cholesterol. Granulosa cells also have the machinery for the novel cholesterol biothenesis. And once cholesterol is transported into mitochondria by the translocator protein, for example, TSPO and STAR, it could be converted into pregnenolone by CYP11A1 and then progesterone by hsd 3 beta. As I've mentioned, granulosa cells also synthesize estradiol. However, it requires the extracellular source of androgen precursors. So in my experiments, I supplemented the cell culture medium with angiostendion as the precursor, which would be converted into estradiol by CYP19A1, the aromatase, and HSD17-beta. So I have uh, measured the expression of these key proteins or enzymes, uh, tra key transcripts or enzymes involved in the pathways. We also wanted to know whether the novel cholesterol biosynthesis was affected. And I also measured the expression of two upstream regulators of the pathways, SREBP and steroidogenic factor one. Here are some example results. So to make the point here, I have the effects of BD47 and TPHP on the expression of four rate limiting steps of the two pathways. 
So uh, the first thing that we can notice is although BD47 did not affect the concentrations of progesterone or estradiol, it was able to modulate the expression of these rate-limiting enzymes uh, involved in the steroidogenic pathways, suggesting the involvement of other pathways, for example, um, the metabolism of the, of the, of the hormones. And when we looked at the TPHP, a concentration dependently increased the basal uh, transcript levels for, uh, for these four transcripts, uh, for the three transcripts. However, under the stimulated conditions, the upregulation induced by dibutocycle EMP was inhibited by uh, TPHP. And for the rate-limiting enzyme of cholesterol biosynthesis, HMGCR, TBHP decreased the expression, and it seems that the inhibition was independent of the stimulation status of the cells. These two heat maps summarize the QRTPCR results. So with all the transcripts that we tested listed down, uh, down the site, and then across we have five or 20 micromolar of um, the test chemicals. First thing that we can notice is the BD47, the first two columns, uh, had very different effects than OPEs. And this is more striking under the stimulated conditions. And we observed the strongest responses from star CYP11A1 and the aromatase, so the rate-limiting enzymes of steroidogenesis. And the changes under basal and stimulated conditions best explain the changes that we observe at the, with ELISA at the hormone level. And the effects here on uh, HMGCR indicates that the cholesterol homeostasis in the cells may be affected. So just to summarize, we found that OPEs, but not BD47, disrupted steroidogenesis in KGN cells. And these effects are likely mediated by the alterations in the expression of key transcripts involved in the steroidogenic pathways. And our data also suggests that the cholesterol homeostasis in the cells may be affected. So my second aim, uh, we have focused on steroidogenesis, but my third aim, we decided to look at a broader range of transcripts. So we collaborated with Dr. Carol Yock and her team and did a high throughput um, transcriptomic analysis, TempoSeq, and uh, to, to look at the expression of approximately 3,000 transcripts following the exposure. So again, the KGN cells were exposed for 48 hours to an OPE. To, uh, this is the same as the five OPEs that were tested in my second aim. And then um, the RNA sequencing analysis was followed by uh, the benchmark concentration modeling for potency ranking and also pathway analysis. To follow up the effects on cholesterol, I also extracted the total lipids from the cells and measured the concentrations of intracellular cholesterol. So this is the TempoSeq result. We identified differentially uh, expressed genes following the exposure uh, to four OPEs, except that TBOEP was completely inactive, even at 50 micromolar. And two of the OPEs, BPDP and TPHP, had a greater number of DEGs than the other two. With the vein diagram at the bottom, we found that um, these OPEs each have some unique targets, but also some overlaps. And we were, we were able to identify 16 common transcripts that were affected by all of them. And we found that their functions are quite focused. A part of them are related to uh, lipid metabolism and lipid synthesis. And some of them are related to specific granulosa cell functions. And also part of them are related to stress responses. To better compare um, the potencies of these chemicals or to compare their transcriptional effects, we generated this gene accumulation plot where each DG was plotted sequentially on the y-axis with their corresponding BMCs plotted on the x-axis from um, low to high. So a steep curve represents more genes were affected by the chemical over a small concentration range. 
And on top of this, we were able to compare the concentrations um, that induce changes in the first 25 response genes, shown as uh, the horizontal line here. And this is the result. The BPDP was the most um, potent OPEs. It was able to induce changes in the first 25 genes at 2.7 micromolar. However, all the other three active OPEs were able to do that at uh, concentrations between 5 to 12 micromolar. And we then used the IPA in uh, analysis to see what signaling pathways were related to or uh, associated with these differentially expressed genes. First, we found that all the OPEs inhibited uh, the activity of cholesterol biosynthesis pathways. And specifically for BPDP and TPHP, at higher concentrations, we found additional effects on cell cycle regulation, DNA damage checkpoint, and also uh, inflammation. Well, IPA also predicts an increase in intracellular cholesterol based on the expression of all these transcripts related to um, cholesterol metabolism or biothenesis. And to verify this um, prediction, I extracted the total lipids Wait a second, yeah. I extracted the total lipids from the cells and we found that um, following TMPP exposure at 20 micromolar, we started to see a significant increase or accumulation of free cholesterol inside the cells. So it's possible that the inhibitory effects that we observe on the cholesterol biothenesis was a consequence of free cholesterol accumulation inside the cells. So the excessive cholesterol would back inhibit its own biothenesis. So just to summarize my last aim, with, uh, with the gene accumulation plot, we were able to rank the, the potencies of these OPEs, and we're able to derive the transcriptomic points of departure, which could be further applied in chemical risk assessment. And with the TempoSeq, we observe a major effect on cholesterol biothenesis, and specifically for two OPEs at higher concentration, we also found effects on pathways related to cell cycle regulation, DNA damage, and uh, inflammatory responses. <clears throat> And the last, the TMPP caused the free cholesterol accumulation, which may have led to the inhibition that we observe in cholesterol biothenesis pathway. So the last, I would like to conclude my presentation with a few significance of the studies. I want to mention that these studies are the first to compare the effects of OPEs to those of the legacy PPDEs, and also the first to elucidate their effects on ovarian granulosa cells. And the phenotypic and functional changes that we observe in granulosa cells may be key mediators of reproductive studies observed in previous studies. And we also identify that the disruption of cholesterol biothenesis as a common and sensitive response to OP exposures. So with that, I would like to thank my supervisors, Dr. House and Dr. Obera, members of my thesis advisory committee, all the members of the labs, our collaborators, funding agencies, and also thank you for the award. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Congratulations once again to you as well. That concludes our um, talks today, and the floor is open for um, a few questions for Vicky. While we wait, maybe I'll uh, go ahead, Vicky. And um, not sure if I missed it or if it's something you've done or, or planning to do. Um, but one question of these different compounds to me, and we have the same problem, of course, in the, in the zebrafish model is always sort of like the uptake and how much actually gets into the cells. Do you have any sort of um, idea? Did you, did you guys quantify uptake or is there anything known about sort of differences between these? Yeah, so we have not quantified like what is the actual internal concentrations, but the first thing that we know is many of these chemicals, they are lipophilic thanks to the presence of the phenorings. So in theory, they should be easily across the, the cell membranes, but we, but it, uh, but they could be the, the 
cellular uptake could be different or slightly different between chemicals and that could explain some of the different like different potency that we observe for the chemicals but definitely that would be interesting to quantify that and that would explain a lot of effects that we are seeing perfect and in terms of in vivo metabolism of these compounds i mean of course you're looking at very specific cell types um so anything known about sort of differences in detoxification or half lives is, is there anything that that's been studied yeah. so these chemicals they are usually quickly metabolized and eliminated from human bodies within hours to a few days but the thing is that there's, they still have an extremely high detection rate and could be up to 100% in human samples because of the continuous exposure. So first, these chemicals are indeed um, metabolized and they're uh, the most common um, uh, metabolic pathways would be hydrolysis. And there could be um, some uh, carboxylase that are responsible for, for their metabolism. But I would say... Um, it's still not many data about like how the effects of the metabolites could be different from the parent compound. Um, yeah, and but but also the parent compounds are found in human matrices. So investigating the effect of parent compounds are also are still important. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, Carol. Congratulations, Vicky. What an amazing thesis. It's really <laughs> a, a fantastic presentation. Um, I was curious now, you've been thinking a lot more about adverse outcome pathways. How do you think, or is there an adverse outcome pathway, uh, you know, how do you think you could use that construct to help organize your data? Would it be beneficial to you or are, is the AOP just missing? You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so we know that for to construct an AOP, we would need to have some um, quantitative or to ex to some extent have some quantitative understanding and also causal relationship. And unfortunately, in my data, I'm seeing a lot of um, association or uh, like between the the effect that we're seeing. But I did not do any um, uh, specific experiments to verify like which causes which effect. So I think that would be the first step uh, if we want to construct an AOP framework for um, to elucidate the effect of OPs on female reproduction. But I do think there are a lot of, um, there are existing AOPs that could potentially be applied to these data because for example, we know that if um, the uh, aromatase is inhibited or affected in granulosa cells and that would affect the concentration of estrogen and that would lead to an abnormal estrocyclicity and then impair fertility. So that would be the simplest AOP framework that that I can think about. Right. You could borrow that existing AOP and branch into it. And it's okay if you don't have the evidence to support it because AOPs are living documents. And so you could you your weight of evidence will increase over time. And, and identifying those data and knowledge oh. gaps is really important to direct future research. So just a plug for thinking about exactly. maybe, yeah. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you. Great. Um, do we have one final question for Vicky? If not, congratulations again. And thank you to all the, the speakers uh, for a very interesting and uh, exciting, stimulating conference. Um, with that, we have a few um, concluding remarks and, and especially pertaining to future announcements. Um, so I'm not sure, um, I'll quickly open the slides. I think I have the slide deck. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much everybody for, um, for attending <laughs> uh, the, the conference once again. Um, just a, a quick reminder that we have uh, the upcoming uh, ICDA awards uh, deadline. So the call has been opened again for the six um, uh, awards uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, the deadline um, this year is, uh, so the nominations are due on July 17th. And um, as is uh, listed here, you can go to the uh, ICDA website um, to the members corner uh, and to the ICA awards to access the, the documents that are needed, um, some more information in terms of what a package uh, comprises of, um, and any submission is welcome until, until July uh, 17th. 
Um, if you have any questions, please feel also free to uh, email myself or Kimberly or anybody at uh, ISTA. Um, so uh, Isabel Plant and Vicky Marla, the co-leaders. Um, and uh, please spread the word uh, in your networks. Um, so um, the more applicants, the better. And um, we're hoping to, uh, to grow this fantastic organization further, of course. Um, with this, uh, there are also, of course, the submissions. Uh, so we announced the winners of the Popular Science Projects. Um, there are some very high quality and excellent submissions. Um, and you can watch them um, on the YouTube channel. So um, uh, ICDA has a, a dedicated, or CIAP has a dedicated YouTube channel. Um, and the winner of the poster can also be seen uh, on the website. So uh, please uh, do consult these, um, these uh, excellent submissions. Um, and um, maybe I'll just uh, continue here, unless uh, Isabel or <laughs> Kimberly, you, you would like to uh, mention these. But uh, there's, of course, uh, social media uh, that ICDA is uh, involved in as well. Um, so please uh, don't forget. OK, maybe, Isabel, you want to uh, continue with that? <laughs> no, move on. I just want to say a few words after you're done. OK, perfect. Uh, so please feel free to uh, um, to link um, uh, the society, um, share the news uh, regarding your, your labs, your research. Uh, there's always exciting opportunities. Um, and so uh, please do spread the word. OK, thank you very much. And I'll uh, pass it to uh, Isabel for some closing words. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And yeah, it's it's just going to be really, really quick. I just want to first thank Jan for the chairing the session. That was really amazing. Thanks uh, and congratulate again all the awardees. Uh, I, I saw that Carol is uh, saying that it's, it, was, it was a lovely session. I totally agree with you. That was really fantastic. Thank you, Kim, to uh, coordinating everything here. You did an amazing job as well. And just the last few words, for those who are around Montreal area, don't forget that on this coming sun, uh, Saturday, we have a cafe at the Biosphere. So uh, so you are all welcome to join. I think uh, Kim will send a reminder in the next few days. Um, and if you want to come and bring all your family, friends, and so on, uh, and talk to talk about it uh, uh, to everybody you know, but don't forget to book your ticket. They are free, but you you need to to reserve your spot to be able to to join us. And for those who cannot make it, you can still follow us on uh, on the web. And again, Kim will send the link to uh, to be to attend uh, live. Uh, it's in the chat right now, actually. So please. Um, be be there and uh, encourage us and for everybody don't forget to apply to the ISDA award for next year and uh and and uh and yeah and that that's about it so thanks uh, thanks to everybody and see you on saturday i guess